we have a couple things we need to do before we officially call the meeting to order. Um, so this evening we have one counselor attending via remote participation. Therefore, let the record reflect that the board, um, that the, I'm sorry, council member, Andy Steinberg is attending remotely via speakerphone for the meeting of August 26, 2019, because it would be unreasonably difficult, which is permissible under 940CMR 29.00. Andy, can you hear me? Andy, can you hear me? Andy, can you hear us? It worked five minutes ago. Andy, we have just notified the public yes. that you are participating remotely. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, let the record reflect that member Councillor Andy Steinberg's attendance via speaker, speakerphone can be heard by all present at the meeting. All votes taken during a meeting with a remote participation shall be by roll call vote. Therefore, all votes, for all votes, the town clerk will ask for individual votes. If technical difficulties arise at, as a result of utilizing remote participation, we will suspend discussion until reasonable efforts are made to correct the problem. If remote participation is connect, disconnected, that fact and time of disconnection and if subsequent reconnection is achieved shall be noted in the meeting minutes. The clerk of the council will indicate that the councillor participating remotely wishes to speak. Remote councillors are to speak by stating your name. You will acknowledge, be acknowledged but would not speak until called upon. Usual time limits apply. All right, seeing therefore that we have a quorum of the town council members present, I call the meeting of the town council to order at 6.39. Welcome all. This meeting is being broadcast live and being recorded by Amherst Media. Copies of the agenda are projected on the screen. We will review the timeline in a moment. And um, they are also posted in advance of the meeting along with the other materials. If you are interested in speaking during the meeting, please sign the sheet at the back of the room and I will explain later when there will be public comment. Okay, with just a few announcements. Uh, we'd like to start out with Mr. Barry Roberts coming forward along with Gabriel Gould. Yes, you do. My name is Barry Roberts. I'm president of the Amherst Business Improvement District, and I'm here tonight to introduce you to our new executive director, Gabriella Gould. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Gould. I'm thrilled to be joining the Amherst bid. Oh, I think I did. Yep. 
Uh, I officially started today, but I have been in the office for a week, um, getting to know the board members better, uh, a few of our community members, and it is my intention to get to know all of you. So I'm going to email you all tomorrow morning and find out when we can get together one-on-one -on -one or a couple of us, um, coffee, lunch, just to uh, sit down in your office or my office. Uh, I moved here from Nantucket in January. I'm thrilled to be here. My family chose Amherst. We looked all over the United States, from California to upstate New York to Manhattan uh, to the Carolinas, and Amherst kept calling us back. Um, one of the reasons why Amherst really um, struck home was friends inviting us to come to the block party last year. We hadn't moved yet. And one of the things I was afraid of leaving Nantucket was the sense of community. Um, Halloween's on the main street, strolls, uh, you know, things like that. And the block party absolutely um, reinstated what an incredible community this is, the five colleges. And I'm really looking forward to getting to know and support the local downtown business owners. Thank you. Welcome to you and your family, and we look forward to working with you. Thank and you. Us with you. Great. We want to just mention a few meetings that are coming up. On September 5th at 7 o'clock, there'll be a joint meeting of the Finance Committee and the Joint Capital Planning Committee. Uh, that has also been posted as a Committee of the Whole for the Council. On September 9th and on September 23rd, the council will have its regular meetings in this room at 6.30. On September 17th, there will be a joint meeting of the council with the school committee for the purposes of hearing the Fort River School Study. That will be in this room at 6 o'clock. And on September 21st at 9 o'clock a.m. going till approximately 2, the town council will have a retreat. It is open to the public and will be posted as to where that will be at a later time. We are going to move to our public hearing. And let me just say, this is regarding the installation on the conduit on South Pleasant Street and a transformer on the South Common. Um, this has been requested by Eversource for permission to install an underground conduit duct bank across South Pleasant Street, approximately 60 feet south southerly of the center line of Spring Street and a pad mounted transformer on the South Common approximately 48 feet easterly of the center line of South Pleasant Street and 60 feet southerly of Spring Street. We have someone here from Eversource. Please come forward. The hearing is now officially open. Massachusetts General Law 166, Section 22, requires that the council hold a public hearing on the petition of any utility provider to construct or locate poles, conduits, or underground wires for the transmission of electricity. This hearing um, is on, obviously, August 26, 2019. It's based on a petition of Eversource to install, as I've mentioned, the various conduits and the uh, additional um, mounted transformer. A notice of this public hearing was published in the Daily Hampshire Gazette on August 19, 2019, and is required by statute. Written notice of the time and place of the hearing was mailed by the town clerk on August 8, 2019, to all owners of abutting real estate. The Department of Public Works has recommended approval of this petition and reminds the petitioner that a street opening permit must be obtained prior to commencing work. Do you have a presentation at this time? Um, I can speak a little bit to the project just to get everyone up to speed. Um, so the purpose of this transformer is kind of twofold. Um, the first would be to allow us to abandon an underground vault that's located on Pleasant Street. If you look on the drawing there um, on the left hand side, you'll see that kind of teal M in a box that indicates a manhole. So just north of that, there's actually in the sidewalk, there's some submersible transformers. It's essentially um, a graded area um, on the sidewalk that houses some transformers that are underground. Um, we like to move away from those. Um, one, they interfere with the sidewalk and it's kind of beautification. And 
they're not the most reliable. So this will increase our reliability by installing this new um, transformer on the green. Uh, secondly, this will allow us to move on for the Spring Street project, which is to relocate those overhead lines underground. And um, in order to proceed with that, we need to create what's called a loop. And that creates a contingency in case of a cable fault. Um, basically, instead of having a line of power, you have a circle. So if it goes out somewhere, you can feed it the other way. But um, we'll probably have another hearing for that at a later date. Um, additionally, this transformer, there's already one there. Um, there's a single phase pad mount transformer. This petition is to take out the existing transformer and add a new larger transformer. Um, also, to make this work, we're going to need to install the duct bank, which you spoke to. Um, our goal there is to put pipe underground to protect the wire. And we like to use what's called horizontal directional drilling, which would allow us to install the conduit without affecting um, the street above. So there'd be um, ideally no road closure during the, uh, the project. There are several phases to a hearing. The first is the opportunity for counselors to ask questions. There's also an opportunity for the public to ask questions and to speak in favor of and to opposition of. Are there questions from the council at this time? Yes, I'm sorry, Dorothy. Um, two questions for clarification. On Spring Street, are you replacing overhead lines with underground lines or is it just adding power to what's under underground? Um, the goal of the Spring Street project is to move the overhead lines completely underground. All right, so, so that, would, that would be, it could be looked at as a beautification thing by somebody besides Eversource, correct? I mean, um, it's gonna, that's gonna look better. That's an ethical call, but I would say yes. <laughs> so then my second question is about the above ground transformer, which is not beautiful. Um, is it possible that it could be in some kind of uh, small structure that could be more attractive? I think we've spoken about possibly um, planting some sort of vegetation around it to kind of disguise it and create a beautiful area around it. But we can't kind of like I spoke to on South Pleasant Street, we don't want to bury anything because there's a lot of problems associated with it. When this type of equipment, it needs to sit above ground. So I think if but we can, could- Can it be with a, in a little house? That's the question. Um, I don't think it could be in a house because that would probably create some issues if someone had to access it in an emergency situation. Um, I think probably the best bet would be either to A, paint it, um, maybe some sort of mural or art project or B, probably just plant some, some shrubs around it. But uh, I'm not an aesthetician. Aesthetician? Aesthetician? So you might want to ask somebody else. Are there additional questions and comments from the council? Yes, Mandy Jo. Could you, it, my understanding is it could go underground. Um, it doesn't have to be above ground, but Eversource prefers an above ground transformer. So can you explain to me in more detail why? Sure, so this is kind of our plan B. Our first plan was actually to add another transform to the green, but we don't want to add more equipment to the green. So our second plan is to replace the existing transform on the green. And um, if that were to fail, then the volt that I described that was in the sidewalk on South Pleasant Street, we'd have to try to work with that. But um, it's not the ideal situation, you know, you're we, we have transformers underneath a public walkway. There's grates there that in the winter months can be a hazard and it's much more prone to a fault. So we're trying to abandon those if possible. So it's not that we would put this one underground. It'd be, we'd have to try to figure out a way to use that existing vault, underground vault that's on uh, South Pleasant Street. Additional questions, Dorothy? When you're talking about the one under the sidewalk, is this, in New York City, there was a situation where there was some electrical thing under the sidewalk and dogs were getting shocks in the winter when there was salt on the sidewalk and snow. Is, is that the kind of thing you were talking about? If there's faulted cable under there, I suppose there could be. Um, I don't know that exact situation. 
so I can't really speak to that, but it's, it's not a situation that we're ever going to use going forward, so we're, whenever we see an opportunity to replace it, such as this, we're going to try to. Mandy Joe. So it seems really big. Six feet tall is three times as tall as what's already there. Um, you didn't provide dimensions for how deep it is. You provided the width of five feet, a height of six. But how deep is that picture? Because it's really hard to determine anything in terms of dimensions with that. Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? It's about three feet deep. Kathy, did you have a question? No, it's building on both of those, the size, and then for the part that's going underground, um, is Eversource paying for the digging and the repair of the surface area? Um, ideally, there's not going to be much impact to the surface area due to the horizontal directional drilling technique, which allows us to essentially bore under the road without impacting it. Um, but any damage that I guess could accrue during the construction phase, then yes, we would, we would provide. And would it, um, I attended one of the meetings of the building that's being proposed to be added to Spring Street, and they were showing utility poles going up in front of it, and they actually did a drawing where they didn't exist, and people were saying that well, they do exist. Are those poles going to disappear, or is that also telephone lines that I'm looking at? Um, the poles are going to disappear if that project goes forward as designed. And so this would, at Eversource's expense, put that wiring under the ground? Yes. Um, I believe it's the developer is paying a, a fraction of that cost, um, Eversource a fraction of that cost. And actually part of this project was, um, to my knowledge, is 10 years old to put existing conduit underground. Um, I don't know if you could bring up minutes from that town meeting right. 10 years ago, right. but um, this project, I think, was birthed like 10 years ago, I believe. Um, so we'd have to look into that. I'm not sure about the finances of, the, of that part. Okay. And then I wanted to go back to these large structures we're looking at. You know, when I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that in various other urban areas. So like over in Northampton, I don't remember seeing one at the corner of the street. So... Is this atypical of the way you would put in transformers um, in an urban area? You know, where there are sidewalks, people walking around, um, homes? Um, this is very typical. I mean, we try to not have them out in the open if possible, but um, with the existing conditions of, of the green and the fact that there's already a transformer there, this is, you know, realistically the, the best option. So if there hadn't been a transformer there already, how would you have done it? If there wasn't a transformer there, then we'd probably have to, A, petition to add one, um, or B, um, work with that vault um, described earlier. So there's already that, those transformers that are beneath the sidewalk. And there's other locations in downtown Amherst where those exist as well. Steve. So I, I, my first question is really for us, that shouldn't we have a site visit for something like this? I mean, I, I'm almost tempted to suggest that we can, that we uh, recess and just go look out the window. <laughs> but it just, with, this with just a, seems a large, like, a, um, if we're dealing box. with things, in, if we're dealing with things with the built environment, I think that that practice would be, you know, would be useful. But then, so, so Google Street View is my friend, so there's a number of boxes and things that are on the, you know, on the common that we probably have become invisible to us. Mm -hmm. I totally agree that something that's six feet tall starts to become less invisible. And the more you try to make it invisible, the more visible it becomes. So if we start planting this or muralizing this, like I'm trying to think that Emily Dickinson mural portrait, that's probably a four feet tall mm -hmm. transformer, you know, something like that. So yeah. Those are kind of my questions, but I have the same concern about the size of it. You had me on option three, I have to confess, that you showed your hand at option three. So. Well, I'm just, I'm here to give information. I'm not here to uh, disguise information, so. Okay. Yes, Paul. Um, thank you. So, um, Eversource met with, with town staff, and DPW was comfortable in terms of 
the technology, and they supported the looping of the electrical lines, which, which is important for resiliency in the downtown. Um, staff had concerns about uh, the trade-off of burying poles on Spring Street in exchange for a large structure on the town common. In my mind, it was taking a, um, putting a large structure on our most important piece of land to bury power lines on a um, secondary street in essence. No offense to Spring Street. Um, so, so, but one of the things we struggled with is that while this is required um, as a town council thing, uh, they would also need to go through the Design Review Board and the Historical Commission to place something on the common. But rather than direct Eversource to go through that process, I thought it was important for them to hear from the council whether you even wanted something on the common to begin with. I wouldn't want to put them through these two hearings to come back and have you say, we just don't want something on the common. And if the council is going to consider something on the common, then I think it would make sense to refer to your CRC committee who can do the site visit and um, do the kind of bring back a recommendation to the full council. Um, I think, you know, as Eversource said, there are alternatives to placing this structure on the common. It is to keep it in the existing vault that they have or place it someplace else, either in the public way or on private property, uh, even in the, in the, on the road someplace or, you know, um, on the sidewalk. It's, uh, our concern has been that placing something on the historic town common um, is, should be the last resort for such a facility. Thank you. Alyssa? As we continue to learn how to do things a new way, I'm concerned that this came to us at all without any sort of preface to it. I appreciate that it has the required components from Eversource. No shade on you guys. You're totally doing the thing you need to do. But we needed, as a town council, an introduction that included what Mr. Bachelman just said before I got here tonight mm -hmm. so that I would be better prepared to answer questions associated with it. Mm -hmm. So I, we need context. And we have done these, having been part of a board that used to do these. They were usually very minor. It was no big thing. There were a couple times we argued about where polls were, et cetera. But we always had a recommendation from DPW. And so this one being especially egregious, there's no recommendation from DPW in here. And there's no preface that I really appreciate that Mr. Bachman just gave us saying, this is why there's no preface in Because we're going, we're doing the thing we have to do, but we expected there might be more questions. I have to admit, I assumed this was just a, we only got this information, you know, right before the weekend, like always. And so I assumed ah, ever source poll hearing, whatever. I didn't look into this until this afternoon. <laughs> and if we'd gotten some sort of preface from staff who can do that expression of opinion to the rest of us, mm -hmm. that would have been really helpful. I, I do want to suggest that one of our options is to delay our decision and have more conversation. Are there any other questions from the council? I, I'm going to step out of my role as president and just say, I think it's ugly. I don't think it belongs on our town common, and we are, in fact, the keepers of the public way. I appreciate your goal in making the rest beautiful, but if it's at the expense of the town, you will hear me oppose it. Now, may I have to see if there's any public questions at this time? Any public speaking in favor of? any public speaking in opposition. Okay, then we're back to any further council discussion before we close the hearing and then move to whatever action we decide to take. Alyssa. So, <clears throat> the being that this is a, a new variation of this, I don't know if we actually do want to close the hearing or not, and I think that's what Mr. Schreiber was also going to speak to, and so I guess I'd look to Mr. Bachman for timing issues associated with mm -hmm. that. Mr. Bachelman, is there an issue of timing? So Eversource would like to do the construction this fall, and there's a, they have a certain deadline when they would have to do the construction before the ground freezes, I believe. You can comment on that in your time frame. Uh, typically in November is when um, any work that affects roadways shuts down until the pavement plans open up. Okay. Is there any other questions from the council discussion? 
Yes, Mandy Jones. So that would allow us to keep the hearing, with that timeline, we could probably keep the hearing open till at least our next meeting and mm -hmm. make a decision maybe then without necessarily affecting, depending on what that decision is, construction. Is that? There may also be accurate? additional public comment at that time. Is there any other question from the council? Yes, uh, I'm sorry, Evan. Design Review Board and Historical Commission are the other two. So I want to, the latest this could be done is perhaps November, but this is the first of three bodies it has to go before. So uh, I, I don't want us to feel as though we can push this off until like October. Um, and I also consider that there are other bodies that will be looking at this um, for those particular aspects of uh, design and also uh, historical appropriateness. Alyssa? So I was going to follow up, no, Pat, just wondering if, if in staff conversations they determined, oh, well, historical can look at it at this point, DRB can look at it at this point, just so we'd have a sense of that. But then also I think that it's probably appropriate, again, it's being new, for us to make some sort of statement to those mm -hmm. bodies saying, well, we had a number of questions <laughs> and misgivings so that they're not just walking in cold, looking at the same thing and not knowing what our conversation was. I think we should communicate that, not just depend on staff to do it. I also got the impression from what you said, Mr. Bachman, that um, you didn't see any reason to advance it to the design um, and so forth if we were opposed. Right. It, you. Um, if you don't want it on your land, you should tell Eversource we're not interested in this on our, on our land, rather than go, go and design something that we're going to say no to anyway. And we sort of struggled with this a little bit, like should they have gone through design review and historical commission first and then come to you? But then the, I, wasn't, I, didn't know the, the, I couldn't read the council as to whether you were going to say, no matter what it looked like, we were going to say no to it, so why would you go through all that work? So we were sort of in a chicken and egg situation mm -hmm. and felt... Uh, and Eversource had the right to file a petition with the town clerk, which they did, mm -hmm. uh, and then that generated this public hearing. Okay, Steve. So as we're, are we st we're still building the airplane, right? As, it, as it's flying. Yeah. So the design review board is advisory, so they don't make dis they advise other bodies, mm -hmm. most most typically the ZBA or the planning board, and mm -hmm. I guess the the old select board. So in this case, I would assume that they're advising the the town council. So it would be, even if it goes to the design review board, it would have to come back. And we would have to choose to adopt whatever recommendations they make or not, or have our own, substitute our own recommendations. And the historic, historical, I'm like, I can't remember which one it is. Same, right? They're also advisory in this case. Are, they're not a final decision maker. They're, are they advising other bodies? I believe the historical commission has the right to say no to this project. Okay. So, but at least in the case of the DRB, they're making recommendations then, I guess, to his door, the Committee on History <laughs> and to us. So DRB would advise the, the town council. Yeah. Right. Are there any other discussion points for the council before we close the hearing and move to some kind of motion? Shalini. So seeing the kind of conversation that's taking place here, uh, could you consider coming back with alternative locations that could be part of our next reiteration of conversations? Um, yeah, we can come back at a future date and um, see if there's any alternatives. But this is, we're already kind of going down the list of alternatives. And in my opinion, this is our best option. Um, and if I could just have the floor for a minute, I'm not sure if that's part of the that's, protocol. Yes, I, um, I just I had a question on the town's petition process as a whole, because mm -hmm. um, I was under the impression that when Eversource originally petitioned to have a transformer on the green, I'm not sure when that was, but you know for the existing um, transformer that that gave um, the utility the right to upgrade that structure in the future. So if we could maybe find something in writing on your end to maybe clarify? Because it's not like I'm applying for a new structure on the green here. This is essentially a modification to an existing transformer. 
I think that's additional information that should be brought forth to the council. Let me also say we can always change our mind. Yes. I mean, I, just because we said yes for a little thing doesn't mean that that means we are automatically in for a big thing. Um, it's like, you know, inviting the camel into the tent. I mean, you just, I, I, I think that's not a good basis. Um, so I hope that you can find another place that will work because we do want this to work. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not trying to impose anything, but I was curious um, what kind of protections utilities have if we go into an agreement thinking we can install a piece of equipment and that we will have access to maintain it or improve upon it in the future, and then um, a future government decides, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. We will ask the town clerk or the clerk of the council to try to find the previous rulings on that. Thank you. Okay. And I will, um, I will look into some alternatives, and when I come back, maybe we can have another discussion. Mandy Joe. So I would like to keep the hearing open instead of closing okay. it, as you say. Um, right. But I want to make sure, even if we do that, can we, as a council, still make recommendations in case the council decides it wants a DRB opinion or something? I, I just don't know, but I think it's wise to keep the hearing right. open. So in other words, I would call a recess on the hearing, and then we can do whatever we want. Paul? So, so you would continue the hearing to date certain? A continuation on the hearing, and I think we should do it to September 9th. Okay. 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 Um, Does that need to be a motion? Yes. Yes. All right. So I guess I, I'll move to continue the hearing till September 9th at 6.30 p.m. Is there a second? Seconded by Kathy Shane. Is there any further discussion? Alyssa. I don't want to vote on this until I find out what it is that we think we'll learn between now and September 9th. I want to know. I, understand, I totally appreciate the idea of not, on the one hand, we could just vote no tonight. But on the other hand, if we keep it open, what will change between now and then? Because they're not going to go back and come up with an alternate location because they'd have to do a new notice, legal notice, to do that. So unless they're just going to make this smaller, um, there's not a lot of options they have in terms of this. And if we find out that we did give them carte blanche to do whatever they want, then that is a piece of information we can't argue about. It either exists or it doesn't exist. And so um, I'm not sure what we're going to learn by keeping the hearing open. And I'm just trying to understand what, the, so that when we vote and then we say, okay, now it happens next time. And I don't know what happens. Kathy. Um, well, I think we could ask that next time we're looking at it, we get a document in advance that provides the context, as you described. You know, what was considered, what are the alternatives? What's the Spring Street light? Even if the, the public notice has been for this specific structure, we could still hear what other choices. Uh, and so we could make a recommendation then to DRB and others that... Um, this structure doesn't fly, but something else might. And it, yes, it would trigger a new process, but at least we would have enough more information to do something other than just say no. We wouldn't be doing a, a completely informed no at this point, given the issues we've raised. And Steve suggested we, I don't know, I guess it was get a large cardboard box that's six feet tall, five feet wide, which is my height, and then three feet deep. And, you know, get a, you know, it's sort of a sense of place on what does this feel and look like, because it's not usual to have that large a piece. But, I mean, we could be doing that between now and then. And Joe? I guess I'm thinking if we do want a DRB opinion, that if we keep the hearing open, that would be then part of the record for the hearing. And since hearings are separate legally from council actions and council sort of meetings, my understanding is that if you're looking for more information, you'd rather it be put onto the record during the hearing than after the hearing has closed. Pat. There's a motion on the floor. May, um, may I ask the town, the clerk of the town, of the council to read the motion? To continue the hearing to September 9 at 6.30 p.m. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there further discussion? Mr. Schreiber. So after this, we'll entertain motions to refer it to DRB or 
to the CRC or whatever? I believe we would have, want to act one way or the other. Yes? Yes, Evan. So, so I heard two reasons for a continuation. One is to get a DRB opinion. Is DRB meeting between now and September 9th? I don't think that's expect. There's so not then, an expectation of that. So then why are we saying we would have a DRB opinion for September 9th? I was saying if the council wanted one, I don't know whether we even do, but that would be a reason to keep the hearing open, right. is so if we want more information to go on the record. Okay. So that was an example, but we haven't had any agreement on that. And, and Kathy brought up a whole bunch of information that we could get. Are we asking Eversource to provide? Is that coming from Eversource? Are we asking this person to go back and provide us with the information that Kathy just said? I feel like Alyssa's question hasn't been answered. Um, I, Mr. Bachman. So the way I interpreted that is that staff should prepare, prepare a detailed memo mm -hmm. for consideration by the council um, in advance of your next, of the September 9th meeting that would identify, just to what Alyssa mentioned, um, that show alternatives and all, those, all that kind of stuff. Um, the only question, and I guess the, the sense I'm trying to get from the council is if you want us to pursue this location or, or not, um, if we should be putting time into them, encourage them to design something for the common or alternative locations. And if they came back with an alternative location, I assume based on uh, Lissa's comment, we would have to go through an entire new hearing publication and process. And the other thing, yes, that's true. And I think the other thing we have to do is to research the modification of existing structure, what the rights of Eversource has under that modification. Right. We'd have to research that. And I think that's a town meeting action, actually. Right. So before we come back to September 9th, we would at least find the previous vote that was taken. And while Eversource might start considering other options and present them to us, uh, if it requires use of our public way, it would have to come back for a separate hearing. And then we may also decide there are certain things we would like to see done, like referral to the design review board with an opinion back to us. But Steve? So just trying to make, figure out the difference between this and say a site plan review slash special permit. So the notice, there basically was no notice, like 48 hours notice for this public hearing. Is that correct? No. Oh, oh no. no. It was published okay. It was okay. published in the paper. It was published. So how much notice does there need to be? And it was noticed, a notice. It was published in the paper on August 19th, and it was um, sent out to uh, owners of abutting real estate on August 8th. Is that a requirement that it be? Oh, yes. Okay. That far in advance? Yes. Or? Okay. So there's a motion on the floor to the wording. Thank you. To continue the hearing to September 9 at 6.30 p.m. Any further discussion? Yes, Alyssa. If I could just add one more piece of to the um, context memo mm -hmm. is I want to put it on Amherst College's land instead directly across Boltwood and because that's the closest, that's not something we'd ask Eversource to go and design right now, but just in terms of the general context of if it's not there, how close would it need to be kind of thing? What are our real choices? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there additional comments? All right, then I'm going to call the question. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I'm so Thank you. There will be a roll call vote. The town clerk will call the roll. The motion is to re delay the, is to continue the hearing on August, on September 9th. Andy, can you still hear us? Andy? <laughs> Sorry, Andy, there's a lot of static. Hang on just a second. How long has he been disconnected? No, he can, he can hear us. He's just trying to. Okay. It's probably because he put it on mute and is trying to come back. Exactly. I'm going to call him back right now. Sorry about that. Okay. 
Can I say something? I don't, I don't want to interrupt the phone call, though. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> You're back now, Andy. Sorry about that. We're going into a roll call vote in favor of the motion to defer yes. this hearing until September 9th. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? <laughs> Councillor Steinberg, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you. That was unanimous that we will defer the hearing. Thank and you. The, uh, uh, Andy, did you want to say something? No, I just wanted to confirm that I heard the entire hearing. Okay. Thank you for doing that. We appreciate that. Okay. We are um, going to continue and thank you, and we will see either you or whoever else on September 9th, and if there's additional questions regarding what you might bring forward, please communicate through through the town manager. Okay, excellent. And um, just as a closing statement, I just would like to say that um, before the September 9th meeting, if anyone wants to go um, look at the site and the proposal while the weather's still nice, I'd be more than happy or someone else from Eversource to explain the project further in context of the actual built environment. Um, I could enter my email address into the public record, I suppose, or if somebody wants to reach out to Eversource with any questions, be happy to discuss this further. So everyone's more prepared for that next meeting. I assume the town has contact information. I know that the town clerk of the council does. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good. Yes, could, Mr. Bachman. Could, could you just make sure, for the record, state your name and your title? Sure. Um, Nicholas Langoni, field engineer, Eversource. Okay. I was just gonna ask, if. Would you acknowledge me or no? Um, if we could also get examples of six foot boxes, that would be. Okay. We'll, we'll take additional suggestions, but we need to move on with the agenda at this point. Okay. okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, the floor is now open for general public comment. Um, may I see, and let me just state, this is general public comment. It is not comment on items 6A, 7C, or 7E. We will take those comments at a time when those are agen agenda items come forward. Um, residents are welcome to express their views for one to three minutes at the discretion of the president uh, based upon the number of people who want to speak. Uh, the council will not engage in dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Those that plan to um, make comment will raise their hands, they'll come forward, they'll sit at the table, they'll make sure the green light is on for the mic and their name, and you'll state your name and where you live. Would you please raise your hand if you had general public comment? Yes, please come forward. I'm sorry, uh -huh. you need to make sure. No, I had to push it. Thanks. I'm, Thank I'm you. all right. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Crane. I'm an Amherst resident, and I'm an hourly employee at the Jones Library. I'm here to express my concerns about the 2019 wage scale for our hourly employees. In 2018, town administrators decided that the 2019 minimum wage would take effect on January 1st instead of in July. This, me this meant that all raises for hourly workers had to be moved from July to January as well. Moving these increases forward by six months would be a costly undertaking for the town. Nonetheless, on October 18th, the former Human Resources Director announced that in addition to the new $12 minimum, a 2% cost of living adjustment, or COLA, would be applied to all other steps on the hourly scale, effective January 1st. Now, a COLA by definition, is a percentage increase that a worker gets in addition to a yearly raise. All other town scales now get yearly colas. The hourly scale has never received a cola. This was to be the first. 
However, as workers soon discovered, this was never really the town's intent. The 2% was in fact not a COLA. It wasn't designed to augment workers' raises. It was created instead to substitute for them. For 2019, all hourly workers over $12 an hour would get a 2% increase only. Now this plan clearly benefited the town, but few hourly workers. While a small group of our employees at the top did gain, for most, 2% did not even equal a regular raise. Most Jones workers will get a half percent less this year than they would have normally. Even worse, since no one moves up the scale this year, the plan will set back nearly all employees for several years to come. Library part-timers, for example, could lose two to three hundred dollars over the next few years compared to what they would have gained with regular raises. In March, I asked the personnel board to remedy the situation by simply providing workers in the middle with an additional half percent. At very modest cost to the town, less than $2,700 based on the former human resource director's figures, all hourly workers could at least receive a normal raise this year. But the personnel board declined to make this recommendation. Taking this step would have suggested that hourly workers are entitled to a yearly raise per their published town scale like any other town workers. And the personnel board seems to believe that no hourly worker deserves this basic benefit. This is the crux of the problem and this needs to be corrected. I can't think of any reputable employer, public or private, who would deny permanent year-round employees like our library workers a yearly review and a regular raise. This is standard human resources policy. A yearly raise for our workers should not depend on the goodwill of the department head or on town administrators. A yearly review and raise for permanent hourly employees must be town policy. Thank you for your comment. Additional comments at this time. Please come forward. Thank you. State your name and where you're from. My name is Sarah McKee. I've lived in Amherst for nearly 20 years. And my service to the town includes a term as Jones Library trustee, a year on town meeting as trustee president, and two years each as a member of the Joint Capital Planning Committee, the Town Audit Committee, and the Town Personnel Board. In the town's non-union employment classifications, a huge gulf lies between so-called regular employees and so-called part-time employees. These terms have a particular meaning in Amherst. Here, if you work at least 20 hours per week, up to the full-time schedule of 37 and a half hours, you are a regular employee. Regular employees receive a panoply of benefits prorated to their regular number of hours per week. Paid vacations, paid medical insurance, paid sick leave, paid retirement, paid bereavement leave, paid family leave, paid life insurance, and more. For regular employees, Amherst really is the employer of choice that the Town Personnel Procedures Manual says that we want to be. If you work fewer than 20 hours per week, however, even if you have a regular part-time schedule, and even if you do the same work as regular employees, you are part-time. You get paid only for the hours that you work. And your one and only benefit is paid sick leave. I understand that some year-round leisure services employees are in the same boat. Now, here's the library's dirty little secret. For years, possibly for decades, it has balanced its budget only by keeping nearly half its staff as part-time employees, allowed to work only up to 19 hours per week. So I share Ms. Chris Crane's concern that the town personnel board is okay with saving the town a grand total of less than $2,700 this year at the expense of our dedicated under 20 hour per week 
part-time employees. At the personnel board's discussion last week, last week after Ms. Crane had left, therefore I was encouraged to hear personnel board chair Tony wonder whether the town needs an overhaul of job descriptions and classifications, and to hear our new director of human resources, Evelyn Riviera Riffenberg, agree. She reports that she is working on a new four-year projection of part-time hourly rates so that mid-range employees will not be squeezed as the state's minimum wage rises each year and everyone will know what to expect. This is excellent news. For the town to balance any department's budget on the backs of its under 20 hour part-time employees, however, remains nothing short of shameful. I would strongly encourage that most library and possibly certain leisure services positions be reclassified as regular with a minimum of 20 hours per week and benefits accordingly. Reserve the part-time designation only for those hourly positions that genuinely warrant paid sick leave as the sole benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other co public comments at this time? Okay, then we don't comment. Oh, wasn't it comments a question? Okay, I'll no. ask it later. Thank you. Um, we are going to move on to proclamations and commemorations. And we have a proclamation tonight for, to celebrate the Jewish community of Amherst's 50th anniversary. We'd like to wel welcome Eric Weiss, who is president of the JCA, along with Jeff Roth, Roth Howe and Boris Wolfson, executive board members, and Janice Levy, board member and communications chair for the 50th planning coordinator committee. I'm not gonna do this without them, so. Thank you. I will mention that the town council all has received the proclamation, and I'm going to start by asking Mandy Johanneke from the uh, GOL, Governance Organization and Legislation Report, to quickly give us their read on the proclamation. Okay. Um, GOL on August 21st voted 3-0 with two absent to declare the proclamation as amended, clear, consistent, and actionable, which is what we were asked to look at. The amendment was solely to the date that it would be passed at council. Okay. Um, is there any other questions from the council at this time? Comments? I'm sorry. Would you, we'd like to hear from you about your upcoming you would, celebration. So. <laughs> We wouldn't pass up the opportunity. I'm Eric Weiss, I'm the current president of the board of the Jewish community of Amherst. I, have, I happen to live in Belchertown. Um, I know you, Lynn, at least a little bit. Right. Um, the JCA is honored to be part of the fabric of the town of Amherst. It's been in its present location for 50 years. We know that that's a historically valued building in town with all of the stained glass windows. We know that we got support from the town over the last couple of years to fix the steeple. And if you ever want to see a good debate, put 100 Jews in a room and have them debate whether a synagogue needs a steeple. So. <laughs> but we made it through, and we saved the steeple, and it's up, and it looks nice, and it's been in the Gazette, and we, it was repaired beautifully, and we appreciate the CPA money that we got for that. Um, Jan has been much more involved, and whenever she wants to chime in is fine. The, J the JCA is seeing its 50th year. It's a synagogue that is thriving. It is a synagogue that is growing which is unusual in today's world. Um, we have a very progressive rabbi. We have a very progressive congregation. It is a place of joy and spirituality for all that enter from any, any place. We've had a number of incredible moments based on unfortunate incidents over the last few years when there have been shootings and all kinds of things. And people from many different faith communities have come to the JCA and been part of what we do, and we deeply appreciate that. 
and we know how unique it is to be part of the fabric of the Amherst community. So we obviously deeply appreciate this. I don't have a lot of the details of all the events planned. Jan has been involved with the planning and Jeff has been involved with the planning. I get to be president. Um, but there are a number of things and we're tying it to, to a number of things that we do throughout the year. Um, and I also want to make one other comment. We have gotten a great deal of support um, and advice from the Amherst Police Department in terms of how to make our facilities safer. They've done extra patrols during different times. They're aware of our schedule and, what, and, and, and those types of things. And our administrator um, has been in touch with the Amherst Police on a regular basis to try to do that. And I know we're trying, we've done a couple of ALICE trainings with the uh, Amherst Police Department. And I have nothing but praise for them. It's been great. It's been a great relationship for us. And we really appreciate their support as well. Are there other comments, Janice? Are there some things you'd like to highlight? <laughs> I think essentially I'll sum it up and tell you that um, our approach to this 50th year was to look historically at how we came to be. And it's, it's really quite a wonderful story um, of perseverance and uh, coordination with the town as well, even to find the premises that we did. Um, the way we're going to look at this 50th year is not just have one big party, that was too easy. We're going to focus on who we are today and really highlight and bring forward all of the good work that's being done in the synagogue and the relations with the town and the community. So we're having a lot of events. We uh, will have a whole program for the year and we'll end with a big party in June. So um, we will send you the, the details of all the programs and we look forward to greeting you at any of our events. And thank you very much for this. It means a lot to us. Thank you. Jeff, is there anything else? Uh, as usual, Eric and Jan have said it all. So I don't need to add too much more than okay. that. Deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Are there council comments? Pat. Your thank mic. I want to thank uh, the Jewish community uh, of Amherst for all the work you've done to support Lucio and his family. Um, and that is, I'm very grateful, as is the council and Amherst Sanctuary, which is a group that I'm part of. Thank you. Are there other comments from the council? I know that our rabbi confers regularly with the other religious leaders in the yes. valley and in the Amherst area, and they talk about things like Lucio and other things, and it's, it's a group that meets regularly to be, be aware of all the different activities that are going on. Other comments at this time? All right, see none, we have a motion before us. The motion is to adopt the proclamation and cel to celebrate the Jewish community of Amherst's 50th anniversary. Do I hear a motion? Dorothy? I so move. And second? second. Pat? Okay. <laughs> Any further conversation? Then all those in favor? We have a roll call vote. I'm sorry. Thank you. Andy, are you still with us? Yes. Great. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesemer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Swartz? Yes. That's unanimous. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do that every time. Yes. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Balmo. <laughs> Councillor Balmo, and now, now it is unanimous. We wish you the best for your anniversary and your upcoming holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. And we have the signed proclamation. Sign Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're moving on to presentations and discussions. Uh, the first item is the proposed purchase of the Hickory Ridge Golf Course land. And uh, I believe we have Assistant Town Manager David Zomack and Economic Development Director Jeff Kretz 
Kravitz. And anything else that the town manager would like to add? Good evening and thank you for having us tonight. Um, what we would like to do as quickly as possible, we know you have a full agenda, is to uh, give you a little outline of an exciting project that uh, Jeff and I have been working on with the town manager for a number of months, and that is the possible purchase of Hickory Ridge Golf Course, which is in South Amherst off of Pomeroy Lane. And we put together a brief slide presentation just to give you an overview of the project and where we are uh, with that. So perhaps if we could advance the slide, so I don't know if Mr. Kravitz will do that. Or... Athena, thank you. So uh, first slide uh, is, gives you a sense of, it's a little bit busy, but there's a, lot, there's a lot going on there in South Amherst, and that's one of the reasons we're so excited about this project. This is a 150-acre golf course. Uh, it is currently being operated by a company from New Jersey. Uh, Jeff and I have been engaged in a lengthy conversation with them, a very fruitful conversation uh, with them for quite some time. As you may know, because there's been numerous media uh, coverage of this, uh, the work that they've been doing there, they're interested in doing a solar project on the property, and that is going to continue. But as we looked at the solar project, we realized that out of 150 acres, uh, there is an incredible uh, number of resources and opportunities that we can take advantage of as a town and offer to our residents if we were to step in and partner with Applied Golf, the company that owns the property. And I think uh, Jeff might be able to help me a little bit here, but um, as you can see, uh, the property is north of West Pomeroy Lane and includes over a mile of frontage on the Fort River. You can see in green all the fairways and the... Uh, uh, the various golf amenities, including a large clubhouse. But what, what intrigued us was its potential to connect people to a place, uh, both this incredible place of beauty, the, the Hickory Ridge Golf Course, uh, but also to potentially connect people with trails that would then lead them to the village center, which is over to the east, to the East Village Center, uh, where there are various businesses and restaurants. Um, we're talking specifically about those residents who live in the Orchard Valley neighborhood and then to the north in the, the numerous apartment complexes listed above Mill Valley, the Brook, the Boulders, South Point, et cetera. Hundreds of residents live there uh, with little to no access to open space. And this would open up miles of trails and connectivity to the village center, walking, potentially bicycling for them. So it was a very exciting project and we're happy that Applied Golf uh, has stuck with us all these months, and we've had a very um, productive, we think, discussion with them. And I think we'll go on to the next slide. Um, this gives you a sense just of where the, the project, the actual solar project will go. And over in the key, um, you'll see that in that grayish green dark color will be 26 acres of solar. Um, in addition to that, just to break out the, the property a little bit, um, in the tan color, um, that is an area that the company will need to mitigate for rare and endangered species. As we said, this, this property is unique in many ways. What makes it so unique ecologically is the Fort River. And the Fort River is an absolute gem in the Connecticut water, uh, River watershed and uh, holds a number of rare and endangered species both in the river but also that make their home along the river. So the state, not the town, but the state through its various permitting processes is requiring uh, applied golf to mitigate. In other words, put in permanent conservation, 18.5 acres that you see along the river. And then the remaining land is really what we have to program, um, which is uh, you know uh, 100, over 100 acres or so. and. Some of that will come with restrictions. You can see in the cross hatch how much of the property is habitat for rare and endangered species. Now that doesn't mean we can't do anything on that property. It just means we need to go through both the Amherst Conservation Commission and the state to determine what uses are permitted there. And those areas outside, the dark green, the, uh, is that tan, the mitigation area, and then the estimated in uh, priority habitat uh, our areas, including the clubhouse along uh, West Pomeroy Lane, 
that would be potentially open for some sort of reuse, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. So we're very pleased to be able to bring you the news that the town manager on August 7th signed a purchase and sale agreement for what we think is a very fair price of $520,000 for the entire 149 plus acres. There are, as with any purchase and sale agreement, contingencies. Uh, obviously, uh, we would need to work through and with you uh, on appropriating funds. Um, the seller uh, needs to get approval through the SMART program for their solar uh, project. And we would uh, uh, work with our town council and, and their attorney on a mutually agreeable easement agreement for the 26 acres. Next slide. As I said, we'll purchase the entire property, 26 acres for solar. Um, we've talked about the mitigation already. Um, Jeff and I, working with the town manager, have discussed uh, an initial term of 20 years with the, uh, with the uh, seller uh, and their solar provider with four five-year extensions, taking it out from 20 to 40 years, potentially, for solar to be on that, on that property. We would need to do some master planning for the, the site. It's a complex site. We need to really look at the natural resources, the access, the potential uh, other uses that could happen on the property in concert with solar. Uh, next slide. We, we need to look at what part of the property would be permanently protected because as you know, if we use CPA funds, which you have already authorized uh, for part of the purchase, uh, some of the land would need to be permanently protected in addition to the 18.5 acres uh, that is required by the state to be, be uh, protected. We see trails connecting South Point and the boulders and the apartment complexes to the north, as well as access for anyone coming there from the public. So we would need to make sure we maintain parking and connectivity north to south and east to west. Through a master planning process, we would look at possible reuses of the building, uh, the, the buildable land, including swing space for DPW or a sale of some of the property, potentially affordable housing. If we need a senior center site in the future, um, that land could be banked for a time to decide what uses the town might have for the remaining land. Um, again, at the purchase price that we neg we've negotiated, uh, we feel as though we've got some wiggle room here for potential other uses or potential revenue generating reuses. Next slide. As we said, the purchase price negotiated is 520. The appraised value is 915,000, uh, leaving us with a bargain sale of $395,000. Next slide. So this is the summary of the finances up to this point. Um, the Agreed upon purchase and sale, 520,000, um, already appropriated through uh, CPAC, 200,000. Um, there's $114,000 existing um, from the sale of previously town owned property uh, that can be put towards the purchase, leaving a, a balance of 206,000. And then You'll see at the bottom there are additional costs associated with owning property that we didn't own before. So we think that um, about $100,000 just to maintain the property, ensure, uh, assure that we have adequate insurance, um, understanding that it's right now a big empty field. People are used to walking their dogs or going on it and, and making sure that um, if there are any injuries, casualty insurance, those types of things. Um, environmental testing, the typical things you do um, when purchasing a property, legal costs. And then if we want to invite people to use the trails, having trailheads, kiosks, those types of things as well. Um, next slide. So the property currently pays about $30,000 a year. Um, the property is in Chapter 61B, which reduces um, the taxable value of the land because it's used for recreational purposes. Um, we've estimated that pilot payments, which are uh, payments in lieu of taxes, would begin at around $40,000 the first year 
and increase two and a half percent. This is for a, a five megawatt uh, solar field. Um, and in year 20, and my understanding is that there is a limitation of 20 years on pilot agreements, and so we calculated it for a 20 year period, but the two and a half percent over 20 years would result in uh, $63,700 in a pilot payment in the final year. Next slide. Okay. That's our presentation. Yes, David. Make one additional comment, just so we're clear on you know the first night here, because people have come up to me throughout the process and said, are we, are we buying a golf course? Are we going to continue to, to run a golf operation? And I just want to make clear the, opera, the, the answer to that uh, from the staff standpoint is no, we're not proposing to have any golf continue on that property. Um, we have a municipal golf course, a nine-hole golf course up at Cherry Hill. Um, this would be uh, studied through a master planning process, and then we could determine appropriate uses that benefit both residents of Amherst as well as visitors for generations to come. And as we outlined, and we'll do more in future meetings, some of those opportunities we think are, are pretty exciting. But we start with the ecology of the property. It is a once in a lifetime property to get over a mile of frontage along the Fort River just doesn't come up in this town or many others. So Hold happy on. to take your question. Hold on, Andy. Yeah, we, we, we dropped this call. Okay. Yes, please. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, we dropped you. Okay. I'm here. Thank you. And lastly, the other question I get is, is this really a straight up conservation purchase? And the answer is no. We've always gone in with our eyes open. This is a creative acquisition, which we see could have multiple uses. As you may know, golf, golf is struggling nationally. So golf courses are coming on the market with some frequency. Some months ago, Northampton uh, began and it was reported in the newspaper that they were looking at a golf course reuse. So we want to go at this uh, with potentially multiple uses, solar being one, and the pilot payment is a wonderful thing over the next 20 to 40 years, but we want to look at this creatively for a reuse to benefit all of the residents of Amherst and, and potentially of make it a visitor attract, uh, attraction as well. Thank you. We're going to have a couple different stages here. One is for council comments, one is for public comment. There will be no vote this evening, although this will come to the council for a vote with regard to the financial aspects of the, pro of the project. So the floor is open for council questions. Yes, Shalini. Um, just want to acknowledge this is very exciting. Uh, I don't know if you're allowed to say that. Anyways, uh, my question, though, is um, what is the annual cost of uh, holding that property going to be? So that's a great question. And Jeff alluded to we, we need to study that more. Um, we need to look at um, what it will cost from a utility standpoint. You know, we have it, it includes a building as well, a couple of buildings. There's a few outbuildings. So we need to look at we just signed the purchase and sale week and a half ago, two weeks ago. And so we want to study a little bit more the utilities, the insurance cost. And then as Jeff said, um, if we are potentially going to open this up to the public, what does it mean to have adequate parking, kiosks, things of that sort? So we need to do a little more study and that's why we put in that $100,000. We don't know how far that's going to take us, but we know we are gonna need some thousands of dollars to pay for various utilities, as well as the studies that'll be needed to look at reuse, surveys, et cetera. Um, yes, Dorsey. Uh, yeah, it also occurs to me that if it's, uh, if there's a walkway from Mill River and the brook to, to the village center, that you'll also, we'll also have operating expenses for um, policing and lighting 
if that's open 24 hours a day? David, please. Again, I think that'll come out in the master planning process. Mm -hmm. I don't, honestly, I don't think when I've worked with staff and the town manager on this, we had not gone that far that this would be a, an open walkway with lighting. We were seeing this more like conservation trails or the rail trail, which is not open all night. It's open dawn to dusk. Mm -hmm. So we would see these trails as open dawn to dusk. Now, that doesn't mean there would not need to be policing because we know our police force does get out on trails, Puffer's Pond, et cetera, et cetera. So, but we did not see this moving toward a paved trail at this point with lighting, which that number clearly would not even touch anything as formal as a paved trail with lighting. So this is really using the existing cart paths, which are quite extensive. Um, I'm not a golfer, but, but I know Jeff is. Uh, I'm a very bad golfer. But when you walk the site, um, the, the pathways are very well established. They're relatively flat and they're firm. So we really see that as a bonus and a benefit for people to walk and hike and potentially bike. Somewhere down the road, uh, the town may entertain something more formal, but at this point, we're talking about uh, enhancing those already existing trails to make the connection north, south, and east. I hope that answers your question. So you're not thinking of it as a utilitarian route from the brook or Mill River to Crocker Farm School or the village center there? Oh, I think we are looking at it as a utilitarian uh, route, including potentially making a connection to, um, to Crocker Farm School, although that would require a new stream crossing, which is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So it will have utility for hiking, walking, potentially biking informally, but not with a paved a lighted surface. So uh, incrementally, I mean, maybe that's 10, 15 years down the road, I don't know. But at this point, we're not envisioning anything that formal, but clearly people could walk this, um, you know, eight, nine months a year. It would not be need to be plowed or anything like that. But dawn to dusk is how we see it right now. But again, okay. we, we need to do some process on that. Mandy Cho. Are the current paths ADA accessible or would we be looking at something like that since they are cart paths? Many of the trails, I think, at least part of many of the trails would, um, would meet ADA standards. So part of the trail could be made accessible, particularly from the Pomeroy Lane from the existing parking northward. I think there is some topography as you get north on the back of the course that would make it a little more difficult. Uh, again, that could be a, a phase down the road to make all of them ADA. 5% um, grade can be very challenging to meet. I'm not sure if any of you are aware, or some of you perhaps have been to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Trail in Hadley, which is just over the line, um, which they made completely ADA, but really didn't have the topographical issues that we would face on some of this property. Um, my understanding is they get over 50,000 visitors a year using that trail. Some of them repeat, obviously, from all of us in, in the region, but that's a significant number uh, for a, a conservation recreation trail. So I think our goal would be to make as much of it crushed stone path accessible ADA as possible. Additional questions, yes, Dorothy. I just want to make a comment for the public that we had two closed sessions on this with very detailed presentations and where we had a chance to ask a lot of questions. And um, I just want to applaud um, the, those of you who were involved in putting this thing together and bringing it to fruition. I think it's a great accomplishment. Okay. Yes, Evan. So uh, I have a uh, process question, I guess. So in the very near future, then I expect that we'll be asked to authorize an appropriation of $306,000. Is that coming to us? That is correct, but let's, David? And if so, where is that money? So of the 520, 200,000 has already been appropriated by CPA. 
The remainder would be, we would put together a council order for an appropriation, most likely from the stabilization fund, so it'd be directly from an existing source of funds. That order would be prepared and submitted to the Finance Committee because it's an automatic referral. Finance Committee would take it under consideration, review all the details of it, and then it would be, they would make a recommendation back to the full council. Can I continue? Yes. Go ahead, Kevin. And so, okay, so stabilization fund is likely where this money is coming from. And then the second question is, would we also then have to um, authorize the acquisition of the property in the same way we did for the Zala and the Key Haskins? Yes. So we essentially have two votes the council yeah. will have to take on this? That's my understanding, but I'd work mm -hmm. with, them, with, with, with Mr. Bockelman and town council. Okay. okay. Uh, again, up, up on the screen now, uh, uh, we put, right. so, I wanted to call your attention. There are existing yep. funds already available, 114,000 from sale of previous properties that can only be used to buy another property. So we're working with, with Sonia Aldridge on, on that. Thank you, Mr. Bachman. So that would require council action as well, the 114,000. Okay. So we would be acting on the 114 and on the 306. I would also assume then we might, in the annual budget, see ongoing maintenance of the property. But the 100000 that's there now would cover this year? And then some. Okay. Yeah. Kathy? My question was going to be, of the 100000 does that spread across several years? Um, so it's got utilities, insurance, maintenance of the trails, but the maintenance of the trails would be ongoing. So. I realize you're doing your best guess to get up to 100. So is it, does that leave some spillover to year two for We, for we believe it will, it will uh, allow us some spillover, if you will, into year two. Um, we're gonna, obviously, uh, before we get to the finance committee, we're gonna sharpen our pencils a little bit on that. But tonight, we wanted to give you kind of an overview and include a number in there that we thought was reasonable um, and, and also acknowledge the fact that there aren't funds in any department's budget to cover this. And there are some unknowns. We are going to be working with town council if we proceed on, uh, for instance, surveying out those proper parts of the property that might be uh, to carve off if we decide to sell some of the property, which, again, would come back through you. It's not something Silly not, I just want to build on this. I have actually golfed that course. Mm -hmm. So when you said Jeff has, and while it's been maintained as a golf course, the trails, because they were golf court, cart accessible and pull cart accessible, are walker accessible, but yes. that's because they were being maintained. Yes for golfers to schlep around the different areas and we tease off limits. So, you know, our, they didn't have potholes in them. They didn't have... Our goal would be yeah. to maintain all of those or those that are environmentally but sensitive. Perhaps there might be some tr uh, car paths that uh, go into a flooded area that we just realize isn't something that we want to continue. But for the most part, we want to try to maintain those trails over the next couple of years as we plan for the site. So just uh, just staying on the cost to us besides acquiring it back on your map, when we talked about this before, there's a piece along Pomeroy Lane that could be potentially, including a clubhouse, be used for commercial purposes that would be revenue generating or could even be sold off. So with the notion of a master plan, do you have a timeline on it that within 24 months, within X, you want to make a decision of that. There's a small, gr no one else can see that small green little piece that you showed us last time, you know, there that's not wildlife, that's not river, that's not solar, that's not, <laughs> you know, but it's enough to do some housing, some multiple units, some concentrated, because I think that if that sooner rather than later, you have a way of recouping a lot of the original investment while getting all the other things we like about it with the trails and walking places. Unfortunately, our, our pointer is not working here, but you're right, where, where it says Clubhouse has the most potential. I think your generous timeline of 24 months actually sounds very reasonable. 
Um, I would not want to commit to you tonight that we could do this within six months or do this within a year. I think it is going to take some time. Um, our goal, I think, would be to come up with the best plan possible. Um, I would not want to have it solely be driven by, by funding, if you will, but what are the potential uses of the property, some of which could then bring some of that revenue expended back to the town, while at the same time working creatively with the solar uh, folks, and as, as uh, one of our slides indicated in year one, uh, $40,000, and then uh, year 10, was it? 20. Year 20 is somewhere in the order of $63,000. I just think those are very helpful. I think in terms of five-year chunks, you know, with a major initial investment and then trying to think yes. of how this could play out Yes. so that you can, as you said, it's not just the money, but it is also money. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're very conscious of that, um, and we will try to move that process along as quickly as possible. Okay. Are there other questions from the council? Lisa. So just a couple of follow-up remarks about the, what is indeed very exciting opportunity, really glad we can do this, is the slide presentation that we saw tonight isn't part of our packet, so if we could please add that to our packet as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And then also I'm hoping this has a home somewhere else on the town website, and building on that, I'm hoping that we are going to do some sort of press release, meaning the we that includes staff, not us at this point. Um, perhaps, or that you could be done in conjunction with you, President Lynn, is that I do not want us to depend on whatever the press decides it feels like covering about this particular issue mm -hmm. to get out there. I think this should be expressed as the way it's been expressed from our viewpoint and taken out there, and I think that would be really helpful. I also okay. appreciate um, various counselors who are going to help me <clears throat> quote nag later when we talk about maintenance costs because it has not been a culture of this town for many many decades to think about ongoing maintenance costs when we do budgets and to clearly and consistently do that each year and so this would be a great place to start that so thank you okay are there other questions or comments from the council uh, just a point of clarification you mentioned in previous meetings that um, Councillor um, Pam has referred to that there is the contingency, you pointed it out up here, of the um, getting the SMART program approval. Do you have an estimate on the timing on that? I don't. I, I think it, all indications are that it is the next couple of months. It could be weeks, but okay. certainly the next couple of months. We've been working very closely with the owner of the property. Um, trying to address any concerns that the state may have about the town's role in this uh, purchase vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, the 18.5 acres of mitigation land that needs to be held by a municipality or someone that is authorized legally to hold land for, for conservation purposes. So. Uh, that's the first hurdle that they are moving through, and then the SMART program will be right after that. So, as I said in my opening remarks, we've had a, a very open and uh, a transparent process with the owners, and, and uh, we're, we're thankful, grateful to them for giving us the opportunity. Does the SMART program automatically assume that the electric company is on board to take the solar electricity there's a very prescri prescribed process that any potential solar generator needs to go through with their local in this case eversource mm -hmm. it includes uh, an interconnection agreement an application so there's a very a very clear process that anyone uh, including the town if we're talking about solar on the on the mm -hmm. landfill needs to go through um, with a solar provider, a, a developer, and then a producer of solar energy. So uh, they have been moving through that process on their own. The town does not have any uh, involvement on that level. We're just kept aware of, of, of their progress. Okay. And can I therefore assume we would not appropriate the money or approve the purchase of the land until that condition of being entered into the SMART program has been met. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. 
I, I basically wanted to say that for the purposes of the public, to make sure that it's, there is timing here, uh, and there are conditions on this purchase and sale that have to be met before we and the sellers are willing to proceed. Correct. Okay. And are there other questions from the council? Sarah. Yes, Sarah. So we had talked about holding the conservation land and that there are, there are species that are um, endangered that are there. Do, do we know for sure or will we know um, if we can use the certain trails that we have? I'm assuming yes, because the, the golf course did, but I'm, I'm just wondering if there's like an assurance that we can get that even though it's conservation, we can use it. That's a great question. Um, having done this kind of work for quite a while, I'm confident that we can continue to use the, the existing cart paths. Um, anything new we propose, um, hard pack surface, pavement, uh, uh, anything in that area that was outlined in the cross hatching would need to go through the Amherst Conservation Commission and then the Natural Heritage Program in Boston. And they oversee rare and endangered species habitat all throughout the state. So I'm confident that we could continue to use the walkways, the pathways that have been used for golf. Um, if we proposed a new bridge or we pro proposed an observation tower or blind or something like that to enhance the area, uh, it's not to say that that wouldn't be permittable, but it would be something that would need to go through the process locally and then in Boston. And likewise on the frontage, anything we propose to reuse the clubhouse that changes the footprint of the clubhouse or the parking lot would also need to go through the various uh, uh, local as well as state uh, uh, process. Sarah? I'm just wondering, um, just because I have endangered plants, I'm, wow, on my farm. <laughs> but I'm wondering like, if there would be any kind of restriction for like, if we use those paths, how many people can go through or you know, if there's ways that we would have to make sure that, you know, people couldn't stray into another area. I'm just wondering, because I know with the saw property, like we, you were, everybody was, like, there's water, like we could have community gardens, and then I think it was an unpleasant surprise to find out later we couldn't. <laughs> so I didn't know if there's just, if that's a conversation that, that, you know, there will be had and there won't be any surprises for you and us later. Right. Well, there's a little good news on the previous property you mentioned, which is we're now working on a well solution instead of irrigating on the so-called Saul property in East Amherst from the Fort, uh, Fort River, same river upstream, we're going to uh, move forward with a, with a well. So a well is permittable, uh, harder uh, is to uh, irrigate from a brook directly. So um, again, the question about, um, we know what, these are critters, they're not plants, so we know what's in the river and we know what's moving along the river. So I think um, we just have to be cognizant and work with our local and state folks to say, here are some of the uses we'd, we'd like to, uh, to put forth. I mean, if we, I don't know, you know, wanted to cut down all the trees, along, not many of the trees along the Fort River and say, because we want to get a better view of the river, that's gonna be problematic because the, the trees have a value both to the critters as well as the stability of the bank of the river. But um, other things, making, a, making a, an ADA, extending a pathway to make it ADA so somebody could get closer to the river for a view of it, that's something that might be a goal, a, a goal that we try to achieve through the permitting process. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions or comments from the council? Hearing none, I'd like to move to public comment. Is there anybody who would like to make public comment on this particular issue? Okay. Um, going back one more time to the council. Any further questions? We have had a request that the town prepare an appropriate press release regarding the intention, and I'm sure the town manager will follow through on that. Thank you for your presentation. Wondering about the refer does the referral happen tonight or automatic? It's an, I thank you. It's an automatic referral, and in fact, the finance committee will be taking this up at six o'clock on 
uh, September 5th in this room. CRC as well? Um, I don't know that it, this, um, would you like to have this referred to CRC? The chair is under the table. The chair is. <laughs> There is somebody, we would like an engineer to deal with the chair. Um, right now we have an architect and he's not dealing with it. Um, so, Steve, um, the question's raised as to whether or not now is the time to refer this to CRC or I would want to raise the question whether or not there's, it's a future referral once we've purchased. Okay, thank you. Um, unless somebody else wants to say so, no. All right, then we are moving on and we would like to welcome uh, David Burgess. It's always nice to have you. David is still working with us as our principal assessor, although he keeps telling us he's retired. He keeps open. <laughs> And let me just mention to the rest of the council, after David's presentation, we will take a break. Uh, so just to promise you, okay? Thank you. David. Thank you. Good evening. The purpose of me being here tonight is uh, to is give you the some... Is the light on? Yeah. Okay. Thank is, you. Uh, to give you some information on a tax classification hearing that the council is required to have every year before we set the tax rate. This year it's going to be on October 26th. And I asked Mr. Bachelman if I could give you a little brief overview of what's going to be coming, because it is a lot of um, questions and a lot of impact to take on one night. Ms. Brewer and Mr. Steinberg are pretty well acquainted with it. They've done it about seven or eight times. <laughs> so, if uh, uh, Athena would let me see the next slide. Your purpose every year will be to set a classification. Uh, we have four classes of property, residential, com commercial, industrial, and personal properties. And the, uh, we have to do this, as I say, every year. Re I want to explain something. A residential property is anything that is used for uh, residential uh, use. If we look at all the new properties that are getting built at the moment, those are what we call mixed use and they're broken into two classes, commercial and residential. So it's, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, your option will be to split the tax rate to, between the commercial and residential properties. We have never done that because it, has, it puts a heavy impact on the commercial and a very light relief for the residential. Uh, but we will bring forward that and let you see it every year of what the impact will be. We can shift up to 50% of the tax rate. In other words, we can increase the commercial tax rate by 50% and lower the residential rate. It does not lower by 20%, it would lower by about 5 or 6%. So that is what the impact is on it. The other properties are self-defined, like in the Western Mass Electric Company or something like that would be industrial. And then commercial is everything you see in the downtown uh, on any level of the retail or um, yeah, all retail and banks, anything like that, it'll be in the uh, commercial property. And personal property is a fun one. Uh, that's business personal property. We have adopted an exemption that I think you did last year of $10,000. So there are almost no qualifying small residential properties that have to pay uh, commercial, uh, personal property tax. Our largest payer would be Western Massachusetts Electric Company. And then secondly would, uh, are some of the apart uh, Berkshire Gas, some of the uh, television stations. So that is what that is. Uh, personal property is only the personal property in the property. And we value that based on its uh, purchase price and depreciation. Uh, Tina? I suppose I just covered that. <laughs> Sorry, but these, this is in your packet. That'll give you a little bit more. Uh, and the commercial I meant to mention is also the, all the farmland. 
61, 61A and 61B. And we will explain those to you at the time because you may not know what chapter land is. And we will go over that. Basically, it gives the the sawmills, uh, people who have forest land a break, people who have agricultural land a break, and recreational land uh, gets a break. The property you just uh, talked about, Hickory Ridge, was under recreational, so they were valued at 25% of market value. All, all their property, uh, all their land, really. So, and these are the experts. You, what you will have to vote, uh, what you will have to work with. When, when we have mayor's approval, we're not talking council approval. This is just an overall thing for the uh, for everyone else. And the town manager does not have any say in this. This is only you uh, each year. So uh, the select our town council. You're going to approve what we certify by the Department of Revenue. We have to have our values certified every year by the Department of Revenue. And by the time we come to you, they will have certified all the values. When we come to you, you're going to vote on uh, split rate between commercial and residential. You will vote on another item that's called a residential factor, which I will go into in more detail than that. And that only impacts the residential property. It is basically an exemption for the owner-occupied properties only, and it's not a percentage, it is a 20% uh, of the average value, so it might be about $60,000 that we get. Consequently, the higher priced properties will pay more on their taxes than they would have without it. Apartment complexes will pay more, and land will pay more, <coughs> because the tax rate will be split into two pieces, for an owner-occupied and a non-owner-occupied. So at that point, we will give you a lot more detail. You'll be provided some information. Uh, since this is the first year, I plan on giving you a lot more information than we will in future years. Um, then we also have the minimum resident, uh, the, the uh, small commercial exemption. We have never used that because we do not have enough qualifying properties in town. And we have a uh, re uh, residential, ex no, sorry, open space exemption. We haven't used that either because we don't have open space. We value all our ex excess land very low already, so there's no point in putting an exemption on it. And the assessors, Board of Assessors, are the only ones that can create open space. No one else. That is basically that, and I was going to throw this open to questions, but I would also like to offer that if any of you would like to come into the office, I'd be happy to explain this in more detail. In your packet, you've got a, uh, last year's uh, document showing how we, all the different explanations, and we'd be happy to go over with that. You will see something like this, or you may see a slide soon this year with a bit more detail. Uh, and we will I'll let you have questions, and anything you want to ask. Okay. Are there questions of the council? Yes, Pat. Yeah, Use your mic, please. Mr. Burgess, thank you for being here. Um, when I was reading through the packet that you gave us, I was looking at uh, residential or small commercial exemptions, um, and it looks like the residential exemption is not something we have used. But I'm still curious uh, because what's the break even? What's the break point in terms of valuation? How many homes, or what are the costs of the homes above that point, that center point, and? The, num the cost of housing below it. All right. For the exemption purposes, you can pick any percent. Per we can pick any percent percentage between zero and twenty percent of the average residential value in town. Last time we did that, that was somewhere in the region of sixty-seven thousand dollars. Last time we did a study, it was somewhere about sixty-seven thousand dollars, because the average property was assessed as somewhere around three hundred and thirty-five thousand, and we used twenty percent. Now that 20%, that's 67,000. If you've got a value of 100,000, 67,000 goes off it, and then you're taxed on the 33,000. If you've got a value of a million, 67,000 goes off it, and you're valued on the difference at that point of the 900,000. What happens is to accommodate the difference in the loss or change is we will take, say there's 4,000 4, properties, we would take $24 million off the value of the residential, 
recalculate the tax rate, and that becomes the tax rate for the residential class. So properties of somewhere in the region of $500,000, even owner-occupied, will pay more than they would have before at the 20% level. Of course, it's different at 15, 10, or 5%. It all depends what we do. It's something I could do by coming to meet you because I'm still interested in how many homes in Amherst fit the higher end right, and well, how many are below. As Mr. Brockelman and I discussed and I just mentioned, we're going to do more in-depth uh, coverage than we would normally. So I will be bringing you information to the council. I would appreciate if anyone thinks of uh, questions that we uh, they certainly come into the office and we'll go over this in as much detail as we can. Um, simply because once we get to the end of the year, we've only got, we, have, we have to have tax bills in the mail by December 31st. That's a given. So I don't want to try and avoid any delays. I would rather not come to you in the, on the 22nd and you say, oh, we'll table this until the whatever date in November. I would like to try and get it done that night if we can. Are there additional questions? Kathy. Um, I have some more generic questions, and some of it was triggered Hold by... Hold on. We've lost Andy again. <laughs> well, Mr. Steinberg really does know more than I do, practically. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Okay, your questions, Kathy. Okay, so some of the background information you sent to us triggered in my mind these questions. So one, in the categories you have of classification, even though we can't tax them, do you ever go out and assess the value of UMass land and property, Emerson College land and property in terms of if they were ever taxed or if they ever paid? It, so is there, and they don't fit in any of the categories you have. Well, um, I mean, they clearly could fit somewhere, but yeah. No, we have not done it for UMass. We have done a lot of work on Amherst College, uh, simply because they want the uh, value what it should be, because if they, if they do any improvements, I think it's at 25% of the value the ADA kicks in, somewhere around there. So they need to have value. And the ADA will only take the assess or will take the assess value rather than the insurance value. Uh, personally, I think it's a waste of time because those are special use buildings, and I don't know what the value of them is. <laughs> no. and, and related to this, um, in other states, but I don't know whether it's been in Massachusetts, there have at times been a look at large public universities or private universities, but tax exempt, and said some of what they're doing on their property is commercial. It's not really education related, and they've carved it out. Um, uh, so running a hotel, running a store, running a bar, you know, so not housing. Um, th so that was one of the questions I had related to the assessed value, and it's separating it out. H have we ever done that, just we as a look, you know, and like, 10 years ago, five years ago. We do do it. Okay. Uh, if you look at the Lord Jeff, sorry. Boltwood. <laughs> right, Boltwood. I know, it, yeah. Is, uh, it is taxable, it is owned by Amherst College, but it is taxable. We do not tax anything that's on the university because they are a uh, state and they just won't let us. So, and then we also tax a lot of land that Amherst College and Hampshire College own uh, under Chapter 9, 61A and 61B. And that's where we are in that at the moment. Okay, my other two questions move away from that issue. And it's something I've asked you once on finance, but I want to just double check. When a new building is opening up, mixed use, and if the downstairs floor is going to be commercial, but it as yet has nothing in it, including it's being built to suit. So we're waiting for a tenant to say, I want to be a tenant. Do they start paying taxes immediately on that property um, as if they were generating revenue? Yes. We will create models for general types of businesses, uh, restaurants, banks, uh, office space. And when we have that, 
We'll make an estimate of what they may be going to put in those properties. We'll come to a value, and then we'll reduce it by the percentage of completion. In other words, if they have not, if you look again at Beacon Properties in North Amherst, the agreement there is that the company building it will put it to the stage that it's a rough building, and then the uh, Jones Company will finish it out. At that point, we'll tax it on what the value is when it's um, incomplete, and then we'll tax it again when it's complete. And for the apartment side of a mixed use building, if half the building is empty for half the year, they just haven't filled them, are you taxing them as if they had rented all the apartments? We are. Are there other questions? Yes, Mandy Jo. So I wanted to go back to what um, Pat was talking about in the ability to essentially tax or I guess exempt portions of a property if it's owner-occupied versus if it's not owner-occupied and mm -hmm. residential. And the last year's memo had that if we had done that, um, the tax rate for residential would have gone up to 25.31. I thought there might, and maybe I've got this wrong, is there a cap of $25 per thousand um, on property taxes? And if so, how does this exemption fit into that? All right. There definitely is a tax rate cap of $25, but it's $25 is as if everything was at full and fair cash value. So you've allowed for the exemption. That's why it's only on the residential class. The other classes would stay at the fixed rate. So you're splitting the money out amongst the class, but it could go above $25 for that reason. Uh, yes, Dorothy. Um, you have to do this every year. Is there something different about this year, or are you just doing the thing you do every year? <laughs> it's easier to talk to you now because there's 13 of you. When I used to go to the select board, there was five people who can answer questions, uh, and we usually did it in one night. So yes, it's different this year. I would like to get you as much information because you're new folks, except for Ms. Brewer and Mr. Steinberg. And uh, so it takes a little bit of getting used to. And I want you to know what you're doing before you do it. Thank you. Okay. Are there additional questions or comments? Uh, I do want to make one, and that is that it, I appreciate your generous offer to meet with counselors individually. However, I would like to make sure that if counselors are interested in meeting with you further, that they go through Mr. Bachman and myself. That is the practice of the yeah. town, okay? And I, I might be one of those people who'd like to learn some more. Well, could I just add that at the moment, my schedule is somewhat uh, upside down, right. but generally it'll be Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Okay, and what we will do is collect those that are interested, and if we actually have a quorum of the council, then we'll have to call a meeting, but we can have a meeting with you. Okay, we'll just okay. give me a few days to prepare. Great. Are there additional questions at this time? Yes, Alyssa. Thank you so much for saying that. That was really helpful. Um, in terms of, I re, and I really appreciate Mr. Burgess pointing out that, yeah, I've only listened to this about 11 times, but yeah, it's still really good to be reminded and it's really helpful, I think, to not only hear the questions, but also to think about how to beef up that section where every time we have somebody new, we talk about why can't we shift burden because it sounds like such a good idea until you explain to us how the actual reality works. Just like people have occasionally said, well, why don't we have a split tax rate between residential and commercial and beyond the fact that everyone can see we have very little commercial. Um, when you look at the actual finance of it, it doesn't work. But it's always, for us to be able to explain it to our constituents in addition to understanding it here, it's been really helpful for you to come have this extra session for it with us. Thank you. And I just wanted to point out that, of course, we are in this funny place of being a town council, which in MGL is often a city and is often called a town council as well. But in the quotes that were up there, there's nobody going to veto our decision, just to be clear on that. We don't have the equivalent of anybody who can veto us. This is our decision. Evan? The date of that hearing is? I believe it's October 26th, but don't hold me to that. Oh, we have to set the hearing, and we also have to set we already have agreed. subsequent vote. OK, so October 20th. 20... 28th is a Monday. Is it the 28th? OK. The OK, the 28th then. 
So October 28th, Paul, and that is the meeting that we have set aside as optional. But it sounds to me like we've just gotten rid of the option. Well, That's we, fine. Well, we can go on the 21st if you want. Let me work that out with the town yeah, manager yeah. when we look at our agenda. Okay, okay, when you do it, I would just ask you to remember, we do have to post this meeting right. uh, as a newspaper, and they require at least 48 hours for it. That's all at the least. At least, yes. So. And we look to you to making sure that we, along with the clerk of the council, meet all those regulations. Okay. Are there any further questions from the council at this time? Thank you again. For, yes, I'm sorry, Pat. I was just going to say, are you doing anything for your own pleasure and your quasi-retirement? On Mondays and Tuesday, I'm sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Uh, I'm going to call a break at this point. We're going to reconvene at um, 8.35. Okay. And I understand that we are connecting. I understand we're connecting with Andy at this point. Andy, because of the intermittent uh, disconnect, as we take on each of the seven action items, we're just going to make sure you're still connected. Okay? And okay. I actually was not disconnected very much. Um, I heard virtually everything. Thank you for letting us know the that. Other direction. We also appreciate your persistence. Um, we're going to move on to action items. The first, which for which there is a slide, and it's up before you, is pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to call on Mandy Joe. It is the first reading of the Town Council Rules of Procedure and its clarification with regard to the word clerk. Mandy Joe. Thank you. Um, so we've got one PowerPoint for both 7A and 7B on our action items, but we're only going to do the first half now until we're done talking about that. And that is our clerical corrections and clarifying the references to the clerk. So on um, August 21st, by consensus, GOL permitted the chair to bring tonight um, proposed revisions that would clarify the clerk references per the request um, or nudging of Councillor Brewer um, at a prior meeting. So that is what we're looking at tonight in the first rules of procedure document. And you'll notice you had two marked up copies. The first one is for this because um, the intent is to vote things separately, which is why they're in two separate documents. And there are five things being proposed in these clerical errors and clarify references. And the clarification of the references is to add of the council after the word clerk in three different, four different rules, 5.1D1, 5.1D5, 6.2F, and 10.6J3. Um, and that, the it was just referenced the clerk, and so this would clarify that it's the clerk of the council, not the town clerk. The second one in Rule 8.2D is to add the word town before the clerk to clarify that it's the town clerk being referred to, not the clerk of the council. The other three proposed changes are all clerical errors, Scrivener's errors that I found as I was going through and looking at the word clerk. Um, and that was, I guess, when we had done the last set of approvals, the phrase with the assistance of the clerk of the council and town manager in rule 3.5 b4 was underlined and blue so we would un underline that and turn it to black and there was an extra space in front of the comma and after the word council so again truly a scrivener's error um, same with the word sessions in rule 5.3 it's supposed to be session not sessions and 8.2C for some reason had the wrong font size. So I'm bringing it all to you, even though I know those last three truly are Scrivener errors. While that we're here, we might as well just be all open as to what's happening. So that is the um, 
proposed clarification of clerk references and some Scrivener error corrections. This is 7A on our agenda. Are there any questions? We are not taking action, even though this is under action items. We will take this up again on September 9th for the second reading. Seeing none, then I'd like to move on to 7B. This is also first reading. It's the Town Council Rules of Procedure. Uh, 10.4 .4 and 10.5 regarding ad hoc committees and work groups. I want to point out that at a very last minute, and I apologize that for that, but we've done as fast a turnaround as we can. You did receive a, uh, an opinion from the town attorney. Andy, are you still on the phone? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I'm again going to call on uh, the GOL, and that's uh, Mandy Jo. So work groups, and right now there's two slides, and we're gonna go through this slide, which is ad hoc council committees, and you're probably asking me, why are we doing ad hoc council committees if we're looking at work groups? And it's because while GOL determined and worked on some language for work groups, it thought that in order to distinguish between work groups and ad hoc council committees, we had to come up with some distinguishing character because we had a problem, if everyone read the report, of figuring out what was different about them and how to write rules to make that difference clear. And the distinguishing characteristic GOL came up with was that work groups would include members of the public, ad hoc committees would not. So you're right now looking at a proposed revision of ad hoc council committees that directly relates to the adoption of work groups. Um, it's, while we did not specifically discuss this at our last um, GOL meeting, it's my understanding that if work groups are not adopted, GOL would not recommend making the change shown here on rule 10.4 to prohibit members of the public from serving on ad hoc council committees, that it's solely there because of trying to distinguish it between work groups and ad hoc council committees. Um, we did move one sentence that was in the opening paragraph down to a, sent a letter A. B is the addition, C and D were labeled A and B, so that's another small change. Um, but, but that's the reason you're looking at ad hoc council committees. So if I can get the next slide. This is the bulk of what we're presenting tonight, um, which is rules on work groups. And GOL spent four meetings discussing work groups. And we also brought in a former member of, well, a member of the dissolved rules of procedure ad hoc committee, Kathy, to talk to us um, about her idea and understanding of what work groups would be as we struggled with coming up with some language to present to the council with our understanding of what the council wanted us to do. Um, this language is problematic and has shown to be more problematic given what we received from KP Law today. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit, but the goal of adopting work groups was and is to, if this council decides to adopt them to make a more flexible way of creating a multiple member body to advise the town council. Um, and so we as GOL worked toward that goal in attempting to come up with language. The report has five pros and um, things that reasons why GOL thought defining work groups in a separate section would be good. Um, the first was to define work groups in a clear manner. The second was to um, specifically state that members of the public would be on them. Um, and to, uh, the third was to remove the formal requirement of a charge and allow them to be done by motion only. Um, the fourth was to allow more flexibility in finding, in creating them, but also in 
more easily working with experts um, and appropriate staff on particular policy areas of policy or concern. Um, people, GOL members, were put, repeatedly pointed to marijuana working groups and parking working groups that the town has utilized in the past as examples of what we were trying to create here with work groups. And the fifth reason for favoring work groups was to have committee chairs appoint members as opposed to the council president, which is required under the ad hoc committee rules and the charter. Um, but this is where also we struggled, as you saw from the KP Law opinion. KP Law came out today and said that whatever the designation of the title, if it is a committee of the council, whether ad hoc or not, the president needs to appoint. This proposed language would violate that at this time. Um, so other reasons for opposing where we struggled with this and where at least one member opposed the adoption of this beyond the fact that that member believed it violated the charter um, was the struggle between what's the difference between a work group and an ad hoc committee and do we need two separate things um, or can we just work with ad hoc committees and maybe make them a little more flexible. Another concern over adopting this language was the appointments process. And adopting this language could allow committee chairs or the president to, um, in the language that was proposed would allow committee chairs to not require CAFs for uh, members of the public to be on work groups and that they could just choose names. And that was a concern by at least one member of this GOL that um, circumventing the public process for applying to serve on a committee um, was problematic and not potentially in conformance with the council's values as adopted in the rules. Um, there are some other reasons that we had concerns. The ultimate vote on this in GOL was three in favor, one against. I was the counselor against. Um, and one counselor while voting, and one person was absent. One counselor while voting in the affirmative did specifically ask that, um, that their vote be stated that it was in favor to ensure that the language was presented to the council because if they had voted against, it would have been a 2-2 tie and would have failed and not come to the council. Um, so we struggled with this over four meetings. Um, KP law has said this language is not quite potential, not, not compliant with the charter right now. Um, I'm not sure what this council wants to do with that and whether they want to send work groups back to GOL to potentially make it compliant. Um, other options as hinted at in the rules would be to I guess pass it while not compliant with the charter um, or ask GOL to rework ad hoc council committees to attempt to make them more flexible to reach some of the goals that the original goals of the work groups would reach. This is a proposed change to our rules of procedure. This is the first reading. Uh, while I would like to engage in a discussion. I would like to also point out the extent to which we have an enormous amount of other work on tonight's agenda, including three items for executive session. So I'm going to limit the conversation to about no more than 20 minutes. Okay? Discussion from the council. Kathy. Um, I'm sorry, Andy? Okay, please. Thank you. Hello. 
Hi, Andy. We've gone on to 7B, and we're entertaining a discussion about the proposal and taking into consideration the recent uh, ruling that we got, excuse me, from the town, town attorney. So, Kathy, I believe you wanted to speak. Um, I want to thank Joelle, because I like this language a lot. I think it's cre very creative, and you did distinguish between the two. Um, the issue you've brought up by the straitjacket of the charter, I think this offers some wording to get around it. And I, you know, in the past, when we had select board and town meeting, we did have things that looked a lot like work groups. So it was the parking group, um, the marijuana group, were those set up by the town manager? Were they set up by the select board? How were they set up? Um, so the, the goal of this was we're wrestling with an issue. We want to take it out, do some more studying, get more information, come back with some ideas, and don't want to take just counselor time. We, we want to be able to reach out to people. It won't they would typically not be around for very long, you know, two months, six months. Um, so that's the flexibility, and I'm seeing Northampton uses these. They sometimes call them study groups. They, they're various names, but it's not a formal committee. So um, it, it's hard to believe that we would set up ourselves in a way that we can't do something flexible. And I'm thinking when we set up the it was a committee, but when we set up the climate committee and we had a mixture of council and uh, the public on it, we found a clause in the charter, and I was going to go look at it, that just said, we can do things if we want to do them. We can create policies when we want to do them, that we didn't have to write a, a word for everything. So I'm just, I like this a lot, and I would, I would hate to think that we can't proceed in the fashion that this is written out, that a co committee could decide that we can't do this by ourselves, we want to send it off and have some people wrestle with it and bring it back to us. So I think this wording works for the intent of what a work group was, as opposed to ad hoc committees which have to have charges, which will be appointed by the president. And this doesn't say the president can't appoint. Sometime the president might want to set up a work group. You know, I mean, it could be a work group of the council. So that's just my first applause for clarifying the difference between the two, which I think is important. I think they are quite different. And a plea for finding the flexibility rather than saying we just can't do it because there's a surrounding document that says we can't be flexible like this. Additional comments, please. Pat. I guess I would like a clarification from my colleague uh, when you say that Northampton has work uh, study groups or uh, what are the criteria that they use to select? I, you know, what's interesting is I don't find long lists of charges and back and forth. I just see they've created them, you know, when their uh, committee is getting a report back and it's not always all counselors. So I don't know the process, Pat. I just, you know, when I... I was on the rules of procedure ad hoc group, and I was trying to read through what were people doing, and they didn't necessarily call them this. They might call them select Andy. committees or study. But, but it was, you know, people were using an avenue that said take it out of just a committee deliberation and then come back to us. Andy, would you like to comment? Yes, um, thank you. I think that there's an unfortunate problem is that um, our charter is different. Uh, we're governed by the rules of our own charter. I'm not sure what it is that we can actually do um, if we have a very clear opinion based upon our charter, which is what uh, our town attorney has provided. And I guess the other point is, is that uh, we could uh, have the uh, president do appointments. It is ultimately the president's uh, decision, but the president could take recommendations, and uh, we could have a, we could explore that as a process. So those are my two comments. 
Other comments from the council? Pat. Um, I guess I'm, I want a clarification about CAFs. Would people applying for study groups, work groups, or uh, be required to only be people who had put out, who filled out a CAFs, or would we be able to go forward and select other people? The other comment I have is, while well, I have great respect for you, Lynn, and you know that, um, I, it, it, in, bleh, it troubles me that only the president appoints um, ad hoc committees, uh, and, and because I feel like that puts a lot of power in, hand, in one person's hands. Now, luckily, I feel like they're doing a damn good job, but I still feel uncomfortable with that. Are there additional comments? Evan. Yeah, so I can out myself as the member who voted for this uh, for the purpose of putting it in front of the council for discussion, um, but doesn't necessarily feel uh, comfortable. I think one part of that is what we just discovered. Uh, this would not necessarily be compliant with the charter until we, unless we change uh, D to uh, the president would appoint, and that creates some weirdness in that uh, CRC might create a work group, but then the president would appoint. Um, certainly, I would assume the president would work in collaboration with the committee, um, but, but we don't necessarily know. Um, my position from the beginning, uh, for those of my colleagues who don't sit on GOL, has been that the goals of work groups could be accomplished by revising the rules around ad hoc council committees. Um, and the reason for that is I mean, currently, in, unless we accept the revision that Mandy Joe showed on the previous slide, uh, there is nothing in our rules that prohibit uh, members of the public from serving on an ad hoc council committee. Uh, our rules do say that ad hoc council committees require a charge, which is interesting because the only ad hoc council committee that we've had that has actually had a charge was rules of procedure. We created an ad hoc council committee for goals, one for the Energy and Climate Action Committee charge, one for the CRC charge, um, and none of those ever had charges. And so uh, those predate our rules. But going forward, if we were to do such a thing to say we want to create a new committee on, I don't know, zoos in Amherst, and we want someone to come up with a charge, we'd have to write a charge for them to come up with a, a charge, which to me actually seems like an encumbrance for an ad hoc council committee. So I'd actually, my preference, although it wasn't part of that revision, would be to remove charges from the requirement of ad hoc council committees. I think that provides some nimbleness. Once you remove charges and you permit, and, and you don't have any language in there that specifically prohibits the public, I don't see how that's that far away from what we're actually looking for in work groups. And, and I always rather would keep things simpler. And my mind is, if you, why have two things when you could have one thing that accomplishes the same purpose? Uh, I do have the language for Northamptons in front of me that Kathy references. They call them select committees. Um, and they do require, uh, uh, and they do allow for, for members of the public to serve on them. Um, they're just special committees of, of the council. They are appointed by the president, um, and so that, that does hold. Um, but the language reads very similar to this and, and ad hoc council. So I think that there's a way to do this, um, but I've, I've never felt as though we need to create an entirely new category of committee to accomplish this goal. I feel like it could be reasonably accomplished within the structure that we already have, given our past practice. Additional comments? Alyssa. So, uh, of course, it's illegal because I like it. So that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. And this is also a reminder of careful of what questions you ask, KP Law, because I don't know why we wanted to know this answer, quite honestly. If we hadn't asked, we would potentially just do this. There's nothing to sue anybody over. There's nothing to complain about except if you don't like a decision, but the final decisions for a work group, any recommendations they made, would be through a committee, which would then go back to the council. So I would argue that there are some other things we haven't asked legal opinions on that we still need, like conflict of interest associated with the Board of License Commissioners, and to be a little cautious about what things we ask for, because I'm not in any way looking to skirt 
the law, but I think that we've made ourselves a mess by doing that, and I don't think it's been helpful. I think that it is very unfortunate, and I don't think that anyone who voted for the charter believed that the town council president got to appoint everything. Now, I know that's an exaggeration. It's not everything. But that was not the intention because they didn't vote for a mayor. And so it's, it's a complicated dance that we do associated with that. But I think that one of the things we might want to reflect back on is some of the assumptions that our town attorney makes about the way things actually work. She references basically in each one of those memos, two of which are republished from before, the idea that of course, for example, in a case where the town manager was appointing, of course the town manager would work with the town council president and would not just pick random town councilors to serve on a committee that he was appointing. And perhaps that's part of what we need to adjust our minds to is that even though it says, even though the rule will have to be to comply with the legal guidance we received, that the president would appoint, it's that we could decide what that process looks like of the president appointing. I don't, I, although when push came to shove, the president, some future president, of course, not the one we have now, could say, oh, well, this KP law opinion says I can do whatever I want. I can appoint whoever I want. Of course they can. We can also decide they're not going to be chair or president anymore. So if, if that happens, like, a few times. So if we give clear guidance to the president then about what our expectations are and don't why did why did you do that? If we just give clear guidance as to what we expect, but the problem still remains, and so I'm I'm fine. I get my head around that. The problem still remains. The reason we wanted these, I thought, instead of the ad hoc, was so that if CRC is sitting there and saying, you know, we really need this thing, but till we put it on the agenda to take it back to the full council, and the full council decides whether or not we need this thing, we could have already had this thing do their job. And since they're just advising that committee, I agree with the idea that that's just too much. I love process, but that's too much process. It's not, you're not getting things done at that point. And so is there some way we could adapt this so that it wouldn't, because we don't want to have to like drag the president of the council to a CRC meeting in case they decide at that particular meeting that they might need a committee point. And that just like seems crazy. It does feel like we ought to be able to have this flexibility that if our committee decides we need to hear something more about small business owners whose names begin with B, and, and they can go off and do that process and come back to the CRC, and then that comes back to the council, we need this kind of flexibility. Whereas I feel like charges, schmarges, we, the, the first several might have been written on a cocktail napkin for as official as they were, but they eventually got turned into something. But they do cause a lot of wordsmithing in between. And so if we could find a way to do some, what we had presented for this package before we got that little downer of a, a piece, I still see a purpose to letting council committees do some more work to the side and bring it and then without having to ask the council for permission. Mandy Jo. So I'm going to try not to speak too long since I presented the report, but I tried not to put it too heavy on my own opinions. Um, one of the reasons I voted against this was because I'm, it, there were many, one of which was I did feel it violated the charter. Um, another one was the potential to not be transparent in who you're appointing to do a committee in an open meeting law body, public body. Um, and I think that should go out to every resident, not just those that the people on the committee know or those that the president or the, I mean, the chair of the committee knows. Um, I think it should be open to everyone. But I think one of the biggest problems, or one of the main problems of this is also the fact that it would allow committees to create bodies, public bodies, that don't have counselors on them. And we saw this problem, and we'll see it in about 10 minutes when we get to the percent for our bylaw work group proposal. Um, what if finance wants a committee on the Hickory Ridge? What if CRC wants a committee on Hickory Ridge? What if GOL wants a committee to study Hickory Ridge? Now we've got three different council committees appointing three different work groups to study the exact same thing and them going out and 
either having the president, if we fix this, to make it compliant with the charter, the president appointing three members to report to this committee and five members to report to this one and two to report to that one. That seems like chaos to me um, and not really transparent. If a committee feels like it needs information on, say, Hickory Ridge from you know, a golfer, go find a golfer and ask them to show up and comment during your committee meeting. Um, I don't see why we need to form all these extra committees to look at information that we've already assigned one of our standing committees to look at. And maybe that's too narrow of my view. Um, but I think the more committees we create, the harder it is for the public to actually follow our work. If CRC has been referred something to look at, I don't think they need to form every time a new committee to look at it if they don't have enough expertise, either send it back to the sponsors that brought it to the council for the expertise, or bring in the experts to talk at the council meeting, at the committee meeting, about their expertise. So I don't think we need this. Steve? So I, I think the exact issues that you're talking about are a reason that we need something like this, and in particular, maybe why we need D to be the president, which I think is a def default anyway. But the, when measures or when issues are, are referred to two different committees, we're discovering it's really difficult for those committees to operate because they don't know what the other committee's looking at. And so that's exactly where the work groups need to be formed is when things are logically referred to more than one group. So we could choose a different protocol, which is that it's sequential, that it goes to the CRC, for example, first, and then to finance after that. In some ways, it's much more expeditious in cases that, we, you know, rep from today's headlines, the percent for art to have them referred to both, but then both get a little bit stymied because they don't know what the other one should be doing or is doing. So, you know, I, I voted yes for this, and I'm okay with the president. I mean, I, I have no choice but for the president to, to be the um, appointing officer, and I see a process in which the president is taking recommendations from whoever the most knowledgeable are who, about who the members should be. Are there other comments from people who've not commented? Yes, Darcy. Um, I just want to say that when I saw this, I was very pleasantly surprised. I um, was on the Ad Hoc Rules Committee, and, and we were um, very excited about the possibility of having something like this that would, would create a situation where we could be more action-oriented and nimble. Um, and I also, uh, like Alyssa, wondered why we asked for a legal opinion <laughs> um, because it feels like it wasn't um, that helpful. And I do, and I have a question about that, and that is um, how did that transpire? Did that just come from GOL, the legal questions? The, as we were meeting on the agenda item to put the agenda together, I brought the question up that maybe this needed legal counsel review. And because I questioned whether it was consistent with the charter. And any time I question something that's con in, that I think could be inconsistent, you may question it as well with the charter. That says to me, get a legal review. Okay, so then you asked the town manager to mm -hmm. ask KP Law. Yep. Um, and each one of those questions uh, is like a certain number of billable hours. Right? We have the we have KP law on a retainer. I don't know how we do that. The town manager manages that contract. So that would be interesting for us to find out because, you know, before we ask our questions, it would be good to have an idea how much we're paying to get an answer for each question. Do we have a way of knowing that? So uh, we do have KP Law under retainer. So they do our general legal services under the, 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 re, this, uh, the retainer that we pay them. 
annually, although we're, we're in discussions with them again uh, to discuss the retainer, the value of the retainer, and how they are billing us. So um, that might be changing. I just had a meeting with uh, Lauren last week, actually, on this. How are they billing us now? Uh, they bill us on a retainer level, and Which I don't know. Like, a monthly amount? Yeah. And then the, every, if there's a legal case, that's, that's carved out and billed separately. Meaning, um, case meaning? Uh, there's a lawsuit. Uh, do you know how much they charged for the questions that we just asked? I can tell you the number of, I, will be, I haven't seen the bill yet, but we will, on our bill we will be able to tell you the number of hours they spent on this question in particular, yes. Okay. Shalini. So I, I'm very much in favor of having work groups. I don't believe that asking a golfer or a single person to come and make a, you know, come and make the comments is enough to really, it requires going back and forth, it requires doing in-depth research and ongoing process and conversations. Um, so I really feel to have a creative, nimble, and at the same time, uh, we have processes in place for transparency. Everything that's being discussed in these meetings is in our minutes. So it's not that there's any underhand uh, decisions being made. And if there's any concern about transparency, let's talk about what are the obstacles we have and how do we um, overcome them. And, but I really do think we need to find a way to work in this way. Additional comments, Kathy? Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat what I said before, but I just wanna react to the notion that if we as a committee are wrestling with something, asking the sponsor to just go back and fix it is not what I'm used to as a legislative process. I'm used to, I'm in, and I, I know my framework is Congress, which is not a particularly effective legislative body these days. <laughs> but if someone is dealing with a change this and change that, one or two members of the leg legislature will usually have a staff person go off and work with a couple of the groups to say there's some differences here, let's iron them out, let's figure, rather than having just themselves do it, you know, so because the sponsors are, if they want to get something through, they want to not agree with everything, but at least understand what the issues are. So that's what I'm used to as a legislative process, that it's not just the elected officials, um, and we don't have any staff, so I can't tell staff to just go out and find a bunch of things for me, but we've got this incredible town full of creative people who are willing to do a lot of work on behalf of the town, and I think that's what this can tap into. I want to ask if it's the desire of the council to continue this discussion at this time. Um, in terms of transparency, the work group would re make a report. The report would come to the committee and would come to the council. And I, I think that makes it pretty public. Um, Mandy Jo? I just want to clarify my, my comments on transparency because I think they were misinterpreted. The transparency is in how the work group gets appointed and I don't think it's transparent at all when it's a committee chair just picking members without any application process whatsoever. That's my concern with transparency is how do you get people onto this committee and if it's a committee chair or the president, I, I my concern was when it's chair um, without any CAF application process whatsoever where you you adopt a motion and then say, and here's the five members, no one had a chance to apply. That's not transparent. That's not open government where we're trying to bring people into the government to get them active because no one had an opportunity to say, hey, I'd like to be on that. That's my, my issue with the transparency of work groups. Shall I? Hmm. I thought I had, a, had something to say. Okay, so since this is a special type of committee, in terms of transparency related to who gets, who is being appointed, I think it's the committees involved, like let's say CRC, I think it's up to them, and they're having a discussion in that, like who are the relevant people they think, and what is a diverse um, expertise they can draw upon, and I think there's a higher chance of actually getting more diverse people uh, 
uh, involved in this because it's a smaller group and they can be approached directly, hey, we really need your help in this committee, can you come and help us, versus having that long CAF process, which is truly incredible and very good in place in other places, but I think it's okay to have these small groups where we can approach, and there is a discussion that's happening openly about why we think, I might think that, I think this person has this exp experience, and Darcy might say, no, I think this person needs to bring this, and we might decide, you know, so there's a healthy discussion openly, transparently happening on the basis of which they will make a recommendation to the president that we would like to appoint this. So. Darcy. Just to add to what Shalini is saying, um, the fact that the group has a finite task, I think, really makes, a, makes it different uh, as far as having to go through the whole CAF process and, and so forth um, in order to be more nimble and be able to do the kind of work that we want to get done at a faster pace. Um, this is just works better. Dorothy. That's my point, that it's for, it, these are short-term committees. Um, I, I do agree that if it were going to be a committee that was in existence for a long time, not to have it open to the public with CAFs would be a mistake. But these are short-term um, committees so that we can get something done. Okay, I'd like to make a comment. Um, so, um, as I looked at this, I said, okay, how does this really play out? Okay, I'm the chair of a committee of the council. Forget the fact that I'm president, okay? You can vote me out whenever you're ready. Um, <laughs> but more than anything, so I'm the chair of a committee of the council, and we decide we need to study something. And we say, we need to study this. And then I actually end up, there's a committee, and the committee sits there and says, do you know what our real charge is? And it's not clear. And I will, I'll tell you, I chair an ad hoc committee right now. It's the goals committee. And frankly, we don't have a charge, and I wish we did, because I'd like to know what my final deliverable would be. So that's number one. I really believe in charges. I believe in committees knowing what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it by, and when they're supposed to come back. If we don't have an ad hoc committee with that kind of charge, then we should have a regular committee of the town, like the Affordable Housing Trust, that discusses this as an ongoing thing. Second thing is, without having a process by which people are appointed, we will always be subject to the criticism of cronyism. And I hate that. When people can't apply openly to be on a committee, when people can't volunteer when asked if they'd like to be on a committee, then you're subject to, well, how did you get chosen over somebody else who might have been on that committee, but we didn't even know they were interested? And so now I'm the chair of this committee, and I say, I want my next door neighbor because I really know that they know something about this. And you say, huh? And so how did I choose that person? And you could spend as much time, and I'm just going to reflect back on how much time OCA has spent on the issue of appointments this year. And you could spend a lot of time in the weeds over how are these people appointed. Whether or not the council votes them, the president appoints them, it's, I mean, we can work out a words how to make it collaborative. But I do worry when committees don't have charges and there's no process by which there is open opportunity for appointment. So what would you like to do with this, Steve? I'd like to approve it, but um, <laughs> in some ways I think we're overthinking this because I think that there's some very specific practical work groups that are being stopped because we're kind of overthinking this. So yes, there are sort of far-reaching examples that you've brought up, but there's another one which we need a work group that has two counselors on it, two people who have already been CAF'd because they're on the Public <coughs> Art Commission. And, you know, so there's, there's um, 
I don't think we should stop the good for the perfect. So you're absolutely right. There might be somebody that's far reaching that hasn't been involved in public art or whatever. But the Public Art Commission people, we know that they've already been vetted, they've already been out there. So we're stopping that if we can't approve, you know, a, a, um, a rule for work groups, then mm -hmm. we're gonna stop very logical, we shouldn't be stopping logic, is really what my point is. Pat, I'm trying to recollect my thoughts. Um, I think um, as a member of CRC, um, where we've been, that committee was created to study the impact of decisions and policy of the council. And in order to do that, we need to be able to meet flexibly with other committees. We, you know, it's, we need to have, we need to know financial impact way before the finance committee offers it to us in, in, a, in a town council meeting. You know, if, if, we, if we need to go to the housing trust, we need to go to different organizations, and I feel like that flexibility is critical to the working of CRC. And, and so I think refining this until it's perfect, which means getting rid of it, it sounds like from many people on the council, I, I think we're making a mistake. I think that work groups are whatever you want to call them, are critical. I think the idea of transparency and charge, thank you, Pat. Um, you talked about charge, not having a charge. If you even look at this, it says it's a specific task, very specific, and it's a specific time frame, and then it's over. Uh, and I don't see it being months and months and months. Uh, you know. Um, so I think that we need to think more creatively about how we go about uh, working together, not just as council, but as a council and citizens of our community, and, and I residents of our I community. I totally agree with you. I just don't want to open us up for the kinds of criticism that come with not having guidelines and rules. That criticism will be there no matter what we do. And you're going to get criticized for a decision you make tonight. I'm going to get criticized for a decision Absolutely. I make tonight. And that's just going to happen. Is there any discussion among the GOL as to the potential of expanding the rules on ad hoc committees or looking at how to make them what you want? From, so I, I will also say that I wrote the initial draft of this. Yeah. And so I actually quite like this. Cause, <laughs> right. um, mm -hmm. But it's actually always been my preference that we take this language modified slightly and put it under ad hoc rules, I mean ad hoc council, and get rid of work groups. And just say, look, ad hoc council committees don't need a charge because we haven't done that yet. I mean, we could say, and apparently now we do, but we haven't in the past. And, and ad hoc council committees can have members of the public. You know, I think there's a question about whether a committee can create an ad hoc council committee. That's, that's a trickier question. Um, but I don't, I don't see it as that difficult. And to me, it's weird to create a whole new category um, for something that could be accomplished otherwise. Um, you know, the, the, the committees that Kathy referenced in Northampton, they're created by the full town council. In fact, they require a two-thirds vote of the council to create a committee. Other study groups, Evan, not the select thing. They've got task force that, you know. Right, I mean, but this, this year it, it accomplishes everything that we're looking for. Um, no charge, members of the public, there we go. Um, the, one, the one thing I had a, another comment, though, since I already have the mic on, um, is if we do this and we maintain, we do the slight revision to ad hoc council that retains count ad hoc council committees need committee charges, I do have a question about whether ad hoc council committee charges need review by GOL. <laughs> 
All right. Is there any direction that we want to go at this point? We do not have a vote tonight. We can bring this up next week and we can vote on it or we can send it back to a committee or we can do any number of other things. Alyssa. Could I just ask that, you know, as we figure out if we're going to postpone the discussion, as I always ask, well, what are we going to learn between now right. and then? And so well, a, I would like to it's have... It's a first reading only anyway. Right. But, you know, so as not to just repeat ourselves at the second reading. I would like to understand, I, I think my colleague perhaps sidestepped the question of whether or not who can create the committee because to me that's the biggest issue to me the issue is not the charge to me the issue is not how people get on it and that's after struggling for months with OCA and that's after struggling for years 11 years of appointing people is that this isn't about saying we need somebody who knows somebody something about this. It's actually going to be, I know somebody who knows something about this, and I know somebody else who knows something about this, and they can come and talk to us. I don't want to advertise for all the possible people who might know that. That's not being not transparent, because that working group's going to come back to the committee, which is going to eventually come to the council, and the council says, who the heck are these people? These were obviously your neighbors. These are obviously the people that gave you your biggest campaign contributions. <laughs> then you say, you disregard what they say. You say, obviously, that's garbage. Obviously, they don't have, their opinion is tainted by these various things. But to say that every single thing we ever do has to go through this elaborate, at this point, perhaps less elaborate in the future, appointment process just so we can say we did it. When we know in all reality, and I appreciated the, 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 very, the very direct nature of what says it's not a charge, but actually looks a whole lot like a charge, it's just more readable, is the explanation of what this group would do. And it said two people's actual names. We weren't like trying to flirt around the fact that one was a former chair and one's a current. It, it's who they are. That's what we need them for. We need them at the table for those things. So... If we're going to modify this, I don't think we can turn this into an ad hoc. I think the ad hoc is still something else. And I really like it. So I would like to see it tweaked to include this idea that the president appoints, but we might have some, how, how we can make that happen more quickly so that it doesn't have to wait for another council meeting and a second reading or whatever to make that happen. It is a rules of procedure, so it's going to have to come up for two readings regardless of what we do. Andy would like to make a comment, and then I'll come over to Sarah. Yeah, I have a couple of different things about it. In listening to the conversation, I was uncomfortable with the discussion as to whether or not we should ask for a legal opinion, and it sort of uh, intimates that it's beneficial to not know whether you're doing something legal or not, and I, I think it's always beneficial to know what you're doing is consistent with the charter and consistent with the law. And uh, therefore, I found that somewhat of an unusual conversation to have. Um, but, uh, you know, this isn't about just about work groups. It's about the appointment process, which I think we we're getting at. Um, I do agree with um, when Evan said that I... You know, we've called things ad hoc committees way back at the beginning of the council process when we were getting in, stuck in conversations. We said, let's appoint an ad hoc committee, and we did it. Um, we didn't go through a long process to get there, and uh, we achieved a result. So uh, the, the distinction may not be all that great, and I do encourage um, all of you to think about it. Um, I, I probably will come back to this in the next item. Um, I am very uncomfortable with uh, designating people by name in a uh, committee creation process. I think that, that um, if you talk about something that is going to be um, questioned by the public as far as what your reasonable process is, um, to create a committee saying we have two specific people we want on it, I think really does put us as a council in a very awkward position as far as what the openness of our process. Um, and I guess the other things I'll say for the, the um, discussion of the specific um, committee 
uh, that we're talking about the specific working group if we get there later. So thank you. Okay, Sarah. Okay, Darcy. Um, I just have a question about the legal opinion that we got today indicated that the president would appoint the counselors. But who, it, I guess I'm thinking that the, the, um, the committee chair could still appoint the re other members, other residents and so on of a work group. It would only be the counselors were the subject of that opinion, right? The, the opinion on the very last page in the last sentence says, in summary, my, in my opinion, the plain language of the charter directs that in the absence of a particular appointing authority set forth in the charter, committees of the town council will be appointed by the council president, while other committees will be appointed by the town manager. manager. That's all members, not just councillors. So the council president needs to appoint all members, not just the councillors. So they'd have, the council president would have the appointing authority of the, non, the members of the public of all council committees. Okay, I think we, we really do have a lot of other business tonight and Mr. Hornick is waiting and he's even two items away. So um, is there any specific wish of this group? We just continue the discussion next week on, I mean on uh, November, September 9th. Um, I would suggest that if we changed one sentence um, and say that the um, all members are appointed by the council president in consultation with the um, originating committee's chair. Dorothy. Another possibility is that we could make work groups um, hybrid so that they have um, that they're both committees of the town council and the town manager. That's like we just did for the Climate Action Committee. I'm not sure and, that would yeah. help, though. The, then we open it up to subject to uh, what, 9.12? I'm going to, yeah, yes. I'm I going take to that back. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that while this is the first reading, we're going to continue the discussion on September 9th in the interest of everything else we need to get done. I don't know that we will come to any conclusion then or now. I think I, I truly understand the need for the flexibility. I'm just trying to figure out how we can get there. Okay. Right. Can it just... So something that might be helpful, um, I really respect the legal minds in our, amongst us, and if they could give special attention to what is needed to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All right. Last thing. Yes. And, and it could be work in progress, right? We can, we can always change. If we make a mistake and it doesn't work out and we find that things are really, we have gone back and changed certain things in our processes. So just knowing that we can always change. Okay. We're going to move on to C, which is the percentage for art bylaw work group. And again, I don't even know what to do with this one now. Um, GOL? So, um, GOL was charged with, well, was, this was charge, a percent for our bylaw work group charge was referred to GOL last week to come up with it to conform with the charter and our rules and other regulations. And while we knew we didn't have work group rules adopted, since the goal was to attempt to have a work group, GOL tried to write the charge to conform with the proposed work group rules. So that's why the motion is set out to conform in, in, as a motion instead of a charge, even though we haven't adopted work groups. 
uh, given the legal opinion today, um, that motion kind of violates the charter um, because it has the appointing authority as the CRC chair. Um, so I think it needs rewritten, but um, that was the attempt. We did name two people specifically. That was one of the sort of more substantive policy changes we made. We did that on clarity um, to clarify who, since we got the feeling the council was actually referring to specific people. Um, so that's why we did that, including at least for the former chair of the Public Art Commission, there's multiple former chairs of the Public Art Commission, so this would clarify which one. Um, on a personal basis, I'm now concerned that those given the KP law opinion we got today that naming people in the motion actually violates the charter because that also does not mean the president is appointing them. Um, but the goal of that motion was to conform to the proposed work group rules. The vote was 3-0 that to forward this on to the council um, with the assumption that it conformed with the work group rules and that the work group rules were actionable. Um, if the work group rules aren't actionable, that might change GOL's vote to having this motion unactionable. <laughs> um, um, yeah, there was one other thing I wanted to say. Um, um, oh, the other concern by GOL was that, despite that vote, was that without work group rules adopted, was it actionable at all? Um, we had that discussion and we weren't <laughs> sure um, whether this motion, because it clearly doesn't conform to ad hoc council committee rules of our rules or procedure. Um, and so unless work group rules are adopted, we didn't come to a conclusion as to whether this motion would be actionable. Um, we made our vote on the basis that work group rules would be adopted. Kathy. If if this change, the appointing authority, so number two, appointed by the chair, if it said appointed by the president, and if you don't think we can name names, can you say the sponsors of the original percent for art bylaw who have presented it to us, so this notion that people have brought us something, um, and that would be these two people, does that fix the concerns you just raised, Mandy? I realize this is an atypical format, but as Alyssa said before, it's really easy to read and very clear <laughs> on what the purpose is and the expansion that you did on this on what the group should do, whether we call them ad hoc group or group or puppies. Um, what they should do is address any concerns that were in the original concern, clarify what we're talking about, respond to any questions raised by the council committees, and come back with a revised draft that would first go to the Community Resources Committee. And last, time, last week, you raised that it shouldn't come back to the council, it should go back to these committees to see whether this one works better, right? So it seems to address everything that was raised last week. Um, so my question is, if we change president, the word to president, and if we can't name names, we can name the sponsors of the original bylaw and amended that we're being asked to address, so it's going to be these two people because they've given us a change. So I'm just wondering whether there's not a quick fix on this so we could create this nimble group, <laughs> which was the original thought behind it. I'm going to try something, okay? This sounds like my first days on the, this chair, president of the council. I move to create the percentage of art ad hoc committee as follows. It shall consist of five voting members appointed by the president. Three of those will be counselors. Two of those will be members of the arts commission. 
The focus of the Percent for Arts Bylaw Work Group shall be to update and revise the Percent for Art Bylaw passed by the town meeting in spring 2017. The Percent for Bylaw, excuse me, Percent for Bylaw Ad Hoc Committee. The Percent for Bylaw Ad Hoc Committee shall revise the previous bylaw to address concerns identified by the Massachusetts Legislature, clarify definitions, respond to questions or concerns raised by the Council Committees, and propose a revised vision of the bylaw for completion for consideration by the Community Resource Committee, the Finance Committee, and ultimately the Town Council. For the, the Percent for Art Bylaw Ad Hoc Committee shall provide a revised and updated bylaw with a report explaining changes from the original percent for, by, for bylaw passed by town meeting to the Community Resources Committee and Finance Committee by October 31st, and they subsequently will report to the council by the end of November 2019. Now, that's a long motion. Let me just go back and recap what I tried to do. Please. I used ad hoc. I created a committee with membership described. I gave it a charge and got a little more into that charge and said what they should do by when. And none of that violates the charter. Second. Thank and might I add, that was much better than your first days. I'm sorry? <laughs> Would, what did you just say? Lynn, Lynn I just had a, I had a question. I'm sorry, on, what did he say? Don't I don't know. know. Lynn, I had a question as you read out membership. You I said, deleted the staff member or town manager, and we had originally yeah, thought we needed someone from internal to talk about the consequences. So do we not think we need They're not a voting them? member of the committee. They can always be appointed to help the okay. committee. Okay, and you made it three councillors rather than three two. Three councillors. Three councillors and two members of the Public Arts Commission. Steve. So one reason I like that is because it, it makes it two active members of the, of the Arts Commission. Mm -hmm. And the former chair can participate at you know, actively, but I, I like the fact that it's active members of both the council and the... The former the chair is still on the Public Arts Commission. Yeah. Oh, he is, okay. Yes. No, he's not? Yeah. Oh. Still, I... <laughs> but still, I think that... Well, then I could a make it a friendly motion and say can, it yeah, either can, two present or former members no, of the I, Public Arts Commission. No, I actually like it the commission. way it is. I like it the way it is that there's active members of the Arts Commission that can be involved in this. Former chairs of the Arts Commission can be involved as non-voting members. Okay. The motion's been made and seconded. Let me just tell you how I would go about following up on this. As I have done in the past, I would poll all counselors to ask you if you were interested. I would also go to the chair of the Public Arts Commission and say, who would you like to nominate? And I would come back to you on September 9th and say, here's who I propose, do you approve? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have your committee, it's November 9th. I uh, September 9th, September 9th. Yeah. And I just wanna point out, you came to me, you came to the council, you came to the president, not me, the council. You came to the council, you came to the president, you said, we would like to form this committee, and, we've, and you've given me some sense of what you wanna do, and we've done it within the structure of the charter, and we can move ahead. And it could all get done in one night, with one more meeting for appointments. Evan? <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm, first of all, this is very hard to just picture what you just did, but it sounds like you kept everything the same, except you added something to five. You, did, you deleted one, I assume. I did. And you changed the membership. Mm -hmm. And then you changed all the word work group to ad hoc yes. committee. Mm -hmm. So we just, this is absurd to me, oh. with all due respect, because we just spent 
an inordinate amount of time talking about how necessary work groups are and how we can't possibly accomplish what we want to accomplish under ad hoc council committees and then we're literally creating a work group as an ad hoc council committee so that next week we can potentially turn around and say but going forward that would be a work group this is absurd to me and it only and if we're going to do this then the entire discussion we just had of work groups is is pointless because we can accomplish we're admitting that we can accomplish exactly what we want with work groups in ad hoc council committees. I don't understand what just happened. <laughs> My point is you can do everything you want to do using ad hoc committees by coming to the president or the committee chairs and saying, you know, two or three of us have identified this and we'd like to do that. Here's what we'd like to do. Pat. Why can't we just call it a work group? Because we don't, that the we don't have the language for a work group. And this, I'm trying to get this committee I know, created, I, I know, okay? I know. And, and I, I hear we you. might still go back and we might still work with the issue of work groups or study groups or whatever you want to call them. Meantime, Let's get this, going. this is yeah. what I'm trying to do, is create this committee. Mm -hmm. Just sit with it, I, I won't. This is, I mean, I will vote against this motion and I can lose that vote. But mm. to me, for us to argue that in order to do what we want to do, we need work groups, and then to do exactly what we want a work group to do as an ad hoc council committee completely negates a need for it. It just proves that we actually don't need work groups. And in that case, why are we doing work groups? Shalini. I think the, the fact that we are creating this group does not mean that we've decided. You may well be right that one way or the other, but the fact that we're creating this group is not that we're admitting that this is the best way to go forward. It's just that this committee needs to get going and we're creating an, making an exception and saying, let's get this committee going while we hash out the issues, whether we want a work group or we want an ad hoc committee or not. And then, and you may be right, at the end of our discussion, we may decide that ad hoc is good enough but we, it seems like we are not feeling fully settled with the idea that that is indeed the best way. And some of us still feel that work groups are going to be more nimble and efficient. And so, but we don't want to hold this process back. That's why we're going ahead. With, at least that's why I'm going ahead with this vote. Okay. I call the question. Okay. Question's been called. Do we have a second to your motion? We have a second. Steve was the second to the motion. Thank you. The question has been called. We need a two-thirds vote, and it has to be a roll call in order to determine whether or not we are ready to bring the, question, the full question to the floor. The, ta the question is whether or not we are closing debate. No. Andy? No. Or no. That's not what I meant. I may have said the wrong thing. Okay. You proposed a motion, and right. it was seconded. Yep. And so I want to vote on that motion. Yeah. Right. Okay. You're arguing right. It, yeah, we're arguing. We're, we're voting I didn't whether read or not Robert's we're ready rules. to close debate. Okay. Sorry. Athena, are you ready to move with us? <laughs> yes. Are you sure? <laughs> so okay. This is a motion to close the discussion. Councillor DeAngelis. Yes. Councillor Dumont. Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? No. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? No. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? No. Councillor Baumiln? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Nine. Nine, four. Nine yeas, four no. That's two thirds. That's two thirds. So we'll move to the original question. Let me read the motion, okay? I move to create the Percent for Art Bylaw Ad Hoc Committee. The Percent for Art ad hoc committee 
shall have five voting members appointed by the president of the council. Three will be councillors, and two will be active members of the percent, no, excuse me, of the Public Arts Commission. The focus of the percent for art bylaw ad hoc committee shall be to update and revise the percent for art bylaw passed by town meeting in September 2017. The percent for art bylaw ad hoc committee shall revise the previous bylaw to address concerns identified by the Massachusetts legislature, clarify definitions, respond to questions or concerns raised by council committees, propose a revised version of the bylaw for consideration for the committee, for the by community resource committee and finance committee. The percent for art bylaw ad hoc committee shall provide a revised and updated bylaw with a report explaining changes for the original percent from the original percent for art bylaw passed by the town meeting to the community resources and finance committee by October 31st and that will move on to the town council by November 31st November point 30th. of order 30th point of order yes um, the agenda has that this should receive public comment before our vote. Ah, thank you. Is there public comment at this time? Seeing none, we'll move on. So the motion's been made and seconded. The question's been called. All those in favor? Roll call, thank you. All those in favor will signify during the roll call. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? No. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? No. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? No. Councillor Baumilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. That's 10 in favor, three opposed. Thank you. Moving on. John, please come forward and thank you for your patience. Okay. I the guess subject I'm... this evening is the Affordable Housing Priorities Policy. And let me just mention to you that this, uh, the motion that we will be dealing with is a referral to CRC. So it may be that this is not, this is certainly not our only opportunity to discuss, but we want to take the opportunity to have it introduced to us. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening. For the folks who don't know me, those still awake at home, and those watching overseas, I am John Hornick, Chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. I want to begin by acknowledging my appreciation to Town Council uh, for your support for the planned developments at East Street School Site and 132 Northampton Road. That's all great, but I'm back before you because it's not enough. We have a continuing affordable housing crisis in Amherst, and we have to commit to doing more. I have a handout, which you can read at your leisure, that outlines the key elements of the draft policy, which we are asking you to re a, a review and support, as well as providing a number of what I would call disturbing facts. First, four facts. 
First, Amherst has no goals for the development of affordable housing. As someone once told me, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Two, among the reasons why we have an affordable housing crisis is that the student population has taken over market rate rental property in town. Since the year 2000, the numbers of students seeking off-campus housing has grown each year to 16,741 wow. students, and it is expected to increase again by a few thousand more this year as I read our newspapers. Three, if you are economically poorly off in Amherst, you often can't find rental housing even with a subsidy. For example, in the last two years, 2017 and 2018, the Amherst Housing Authority, our local housing authority, issued a total of 70 Section 8 or movable housing vouchers. Of the 70, only 16 were leased up in Amherst. 23 expired before they could leased up, be leased up anywhere in the area, including Holyoke and Springfield. Four, rents continue to rise in Amherst, exceeding the resources of both low and middle income individuals and families. An estimated 75% of renter households are either cost burdened or severely cost burdened, which means that more than half of their income is allocated to the costs of housing. What can we do about it? The first step in creating a commitment is to set some goals. We can go from being a town which has no goals for the development of affordable housing to a town which has goals. The town policy drafted by the Housing Trust that we are asking you to review, first and foremost, will set goals. And further, to make a commitment to then meet those goals 250 new units of affordable housing over the next five years or so. It's a bit of a stretch, but we can do it if we set our hearts as well as our minds to it. On behalf of the Housing Trust, I look forward to your review and eventual approval of a real town housing policy. Please join us in this enterprise and also in our fall housing forum, likely early in November. Thank you for your past support and consideration of this draft town policy. If you have questions, I'll be glad to try to address them. Are there questions at this time? Yes, Alyssa. So I, I appreciate the additional two-page handout, which I'm sure will get added to our packet sometime tomorrow, in addition to the 12-page document we already had. In between these two documents, though, on my friend, I'm not seeing the policy that I actually need to pass. And so I'm trying to understand, do you want, do you mean the first four pages or exactly which I, all this documentation is excellent. It's just what's the actual policy you're gonna want us to eventually pass after it goes through CRC? A fair question. And I'm sorry for the ambiguity. There's a little bit of a preamble, which is about the first half or two thirds of a page of the full document. And then the, the actual policy is the next three or so pages until you come to the justification. You are not being asked to either uh, adopt the preamble or adopt the justification, particularly the kind of facts or information that's there or that I briefly pointed to tonight. So it is about three and a half pages of prose that would constitute the town policy. Is that clear? If I might. Yes, Alyssa, I'm sorry. It is, but it's too long. And so I will ask the CRC, you know, as we continue this discussion to work on a way. I, I can't, 
I can't imagine how we're going to actually manage a four-page policy. And so what that actually means on a practical basis for what direction we're giving, because this is a lot of pros. Again, all incredibly valuable as to why we got where we got to. But what will it mean to have a four-page housing policy? What will be done with that four-page housing policy? Okay, and that's an appropriate question to CRC. Evan? Did you have a question? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, Shalini. So I was looking at your Amherst Housing Trust strategic plan for the year 18 to 22, and in that, the largest unmet need was with respect to uh, people with disabilities and following houses for homelessness. And I was wondering why there was no I mean, those, that was not incorporated in the goals that you sent us housing for, and also workforce housing, but that's another need. Okay, I, I can address the first, and that is I did think, and it is included on the uh, two-page document that I distributed, that there are goals that are by population. The units or a number of units to be developed for each specific population are, are not present in the goals. The goals are more directed to uh, the levels of economic difficulty that people are in, 80% AMI, 50% AMI, et cetera. Um, frankly, 250 units is not very much. Um, it's probably as much as the town can do. Unlikely that we can do more, um, even with the anticipated addition of outside dollars from the Department of Housing Community Development. So to some extent, what gets developed may be serendipitous depending upon, or I should say opportunistic would be a better way of looking at it, depending upon the location and depending upon where people generally perceive the greatest need. But if you look at the length here, policies that we have earlier adopted, uh, the housing production plan and the housing market study, um, they, uh, again, are generally not specific, but talk about numbers, that, particularly the housing production plan, that are much greater than the 250 in terms of need that I've just mentioned. So I think we need a realistic policy. It may still be a stretch goal, but it's something. And then within that, I think we have to decide what the priorities are. Um, but what's most important is at least putting a number out there that says, is our goal, and we're going to monitor and see how we do over the next five years. I assume it will include units for people who are or have been homeless, units for low-income families, and then along with the first two units for people who are as individuals are low income, some of whom are going to be disabled. Um, it will include some support for home ownership, et cetera, all of which are good goals. But I would be reluctant at this point to say how many units would be assigned to each of those populations. Dorothy. Um, I read the bigger policy. And what I see lacking are qualifiers, adjectives. There's nothing that says what kind of housing um, or that addresses um, a sense of community, places to gather, um, recreational areas. Now, I've seen some of the really great community housing in town. Uh, and so I know that you've done it. But when uh, you set a big goal and we have a big need, I, f I fear something like um, Soviet concrete block places where you say, yes, we have housed everybody. But I don't think we want that. So I know it's a very difficult thing when we don't know how you're going to pay for this, um, but we have to do it. But I do think that some of those words and, and concepts have to be in the policy. Um, in principle, that's fine from my point of view. If you look at the request for proposals that the town has recently released for the E Street project, it does include reference to those kinds of amenities as part of the responsibility of the developer. So I think your point is well taken. 
it is certainly something that we all should want to see. Are there other comments at this time, remembering that this is a referral to CRC, or that there will be a motion to refer to CRC? Yes. I, I have some basic background types of information that will help me understand how we got to 250, or whatever number is in, and so um, I can send them to you, John, but I, you know, they're just, it, it's a little along the line Dorothy just asked, but I don't even know how we count units. So if I create a two-bedroom house, is that two units or is it one? If I create a studio apartment that can only have one, is that one? So is it the physical thing? Um, and I would love to see how much have we actually created since 2013? How much have we created or it's in the pipeline? Um, total housing as well as what subset. So it, it's some specifics because I, we don't count in our affordable stock, as I understand it, when um, CPA gives vouchers to go decrease the rent in places that aren't, aren't official Section 8, and we're not giving a lot of those, but they don't count, I don't think, toward the number of units we've got working, and they're not new, and how do we count Habitat for Humanity houses? I just like, would like a better sense of that. And then I um, was, I looked at the statistics about families with kids and the, the age distribution and being data-driven usually. I looked at the state of Massachusetts. We're down 100,000 kids in the state. This is a national phenomenon that even when we get families, they don't necessarily have children anymore in them. And so part of why we've got such a skewed percentage is if you took the students out of our population and said who you know who are just here for a few years we're not that much lower Northampton's been going down you know our surrounding communities are going down it's just that we've got this big chunk of um, 18 to 24 year olds that nobody has and is concentrated so it's a little bit more framing because are we expanding the total housing base you know what's UMass doing um, and how much of the stuff that's coming online, where quite a bit is coming online, will be completely unaffordable for the targeted group, or can some of them be marginally more affordable? So I, I just need more. So if CRC asks for just more, you know, how do you come up with a number as the target, given like who you're trying to reach? Okay, I can briefly answer a couple of your queries. One is a unit is the physical unit, irrespective of whether it's a studio apartment for one person or a three-bedroom uh, unit for a family. Uh, units are formally counted if they go on the state subsidized housing inventory, and there are formal rules for whether they are considered affordable and therefore counted on the subsidized housing inventory. I don't love all the rules, but there you are. Uh, uh, I was gonna... Uh, I'll, I'll give just, it helps me more to get a, a larger framework because I, the total population is not actually growing that fast of the town of Amherst. It's just the who, who is living here. Is, yes, is I agree. I, I was gonna yeah. also say that yeah. as far as new units, the. Uh, town planning department does a very good job of tracking those. Yeah. Um, so those should be readily available both with respect to what's been developed in the last few years as well as what's expected to come online in the next year or two. Um, the major pressure comes from the university. Uh, it's not only from there. There are other reasons why uh, we don't have housing we have really lost housing for young families. One of it is the town has people like me who once had kids living in their house who went to the Amherst school, but now we've aged out, but we still live in the town. And there are a lot of us here as well. So it's important to acknowledge that as one of the reasons why we have less housing for young families. But there's no question that uh, it's gone down. I agree it's a statewide phenomena, it's a local phenomena, but frankly from the analysis that I asked the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to do for us, 
the rate at which the number of school-age children has dropped in Amherst, or at least families with school-age children, is more precipitous than what we've seen in Northampton or the rest of Hampshire County. And I think it's because, you know, if you look around my neighborhood, you have families that kind of aged out of having children, but in a two blocks, which has 25 units, eight of them are now occupied as student rentals, and there were no student rentals when I moved into that neighborhood. I, d I don't disagree with that. I'm just, just a framework would be helpful. And when I, when I went out um, campaigning, one of the things I thought was pretty remarkable is my voter list had eight people living in a house with two bedrooms in it. <laughs> and that wasn't supposed to be possible. They were the student rentals. Right. So we don't police the number. And we, you know, on the voter list, there that were many people. And you could kind of the cars. So we also allow, we're pushing that housing stock out of the marketplace. So I understand it's, it's, it's a demand and supply issue. I just, a little bit more because otherwise we're always racing against the clock. You know, because, you know, if UMass doesn't start to create more on campus or worry about this, it's, it's taking the stock we have that used to be reasonable when someone ages out of their place, and then off it goes. Yeah. I don't disagree. I'd like to suggest that we move, but by doing so, ask that the chair of CRC consider calling one of your meetings as a committee of the council, and we can then have a much more in-depth joint meeting with, through your committee, if that would be possible. Because I think there's a lot more questions, and I don't want to rush you nor others into that conversation. Is that okay? Uh, if there's no other, are there any other questions at this point or points to be made? Yes. I'm always leery of these additional meetings we have that are outside of council meetings that we're really kind of all expected to be there for. And we did okay. that with a bunch of finance committee meetings, and now we're doing it with a CRC meeting, which is typically not at a time that people who are not on CRC can attend. And so I, I totally get what you're talking about, mm -hmm. but I think the reality is we should be done with our agenda in the next 10 minutes, and we haven't even touched on one of the most important things we do as a council, because our agenda was too full tonight. So I don't know that we can fix that by all going to a CRC meeting instead. I think we just need to have another discussion, but maybe it's not immediate as much as we'd like it to be soon, or maybe CRC works on it for a while and then brings it back. Mm -hmm. That's fine, too. Okay or they might schedule it at a different time, or whatever. Be open to it. Shalini? I also wanted some clarity around what we are asking the CRC to do is in terms of, um, are they gonna be setting goals for, uh, for housing, affordable housing in town and are we looking at even strategy? Like, so there's some policy implications around the tax incentives we give, or so, or zoning, or so. Are they also going to be looking at how to make that goal possible, or and what else will that be? And, and, and homelessness? What What are we doing with that? Where do we send the homeless people? I mean, there are a lot of questions around it. So, what are we asking the CRC to look at? Those are very good questions. I just one thing to amend. As I said in my letter to President Griesmer, uh, I am also asking the Community Preservation Act Committee and the Planning Board to look at the policy at the same time. And so I expect that each group will have its own changes that it wants to make. And then in the end, we somehow put them together and come back to be in a position where we're all on the same page with respect to the development of new affordable housing in town. It's Mandy Jo. So is this then something that ultimately our recommendations or requests go back to the Affordable Housing Trust before we act as a full council on this? It would seem to me that you're in the process of collecting feedback that we go back to the Affordable Housing Trust and then come back to the council. 
I, that's what makes sense to me, since I think that not only does the council and the trust have a role to play in these developments, but the planning board and CPAC also have significant roles to play. And so I think there needs to be some unity around what we're planning to do. And so I think we need a process that leads us there. Do you have a timeline that you're working on? Um, well, I've asked each group to get back to us with some feedback by October 1, because I don't want the process to go on forever. I understand there may be obstacles to that, but that was the initial request that I made. Um, it would be great if we have a policy, final policy, that we can ask each board, including the town council, to adopt, say, by the end of November or certainly by the end of the calendar year. So it seems to me, going back to your question, Shalini, that what we're asking CRC to do is to review the proposed policy uh, with regard to issues that we've already raised and additional ones that they may cite and make recommendations back to the council or back to the affordable housing. I think we're a little concerned about the process here. Well, ultimately, the council, among the groups that I've mentioned, is clearly the most determinative. Right. So I think that, uh, again, I. I can't tell you what to do. It may make sense once the CRC has processed this to say, okay, let's go back to the council and get some additional feedback or agreement from the full council. Mm -hmm. Or it may say, well, before we take to the full council, we want to know what feedback you've gotten from the other committees and put that into our thinking as well. All right. Let me suggest that CRC needs to come back to the full council with a set of recommendations, et cetera, with regard to this that would then be forwarded to the Housing Authority. We would not necessarily at that, we are certainly not at that point going to vote on the policy. We're not, going to vote on the policy with the first report coming back from CRC. It's, it's going to go then back to the Housing Trust and then they will make revisions and come back for another round of review. Yeah, okay. I, that's what I expect will ultimately happen. Because as I said, we're trying to get the entire town or at least all the key actors on the same page. Okay. Could you also provide us with the outline of your timeline and your reviews and so forth so that we kind of understand where to fit this in with our agendas? Uh, I'll do my best. Thank you. Like I said, it's a little dependent upon those other groups as well. Right. Um, are there additional questions? Shalini. Again, I don't know where this question fits in, um, but what I've been learning so far is that we may have housing, but there's uh, no central organization through which people who need the housing can go through. It seems like even if they get vouchers, they have to go, it's on them to go and find where the units are. So it's not like there's a central list. And once people are on the list, then they are notified. It's like, it's, it, it seems, I mean, that's something to consider, like what are other towns doing? Is there a central housing, you know, processing through that and also a database that's central, that's collecting information. If you don't know how many homeless people are, what's happening then, so do we have the data collecting um, happening in town locally? We have some data, but I would not say we have complete data. Um, the Housing Authority maintains its own list for its own purposes to refer people of where there are units available in town. On the other hand, you know, it's their experience notes and my source is Aaron Cassidy, who's in charge of the mobile voucher program at the Housing Authority. Um, that information alone 
does not assure someone is going to get a place to live. Far from it. Okay. Other, yes, George. I think for me the, the biggest challenge in this is going to be how to fit it into the larger picture. How to Give me fit it into the larger picture of housing in Amherst and whether CRC will be helping us with that question or helping me, planning department. Um, I don't see how I can create a affordable housing policy without a larger sense of the overall housing situation and how it fits into that. Um, so it's something I'm hoping that CRC can help me with, something I'll be thinking about a lot as well. But passing on this policy in isolation is something that troubles me. So I, I need to have a, a sense of the bigger picture. Yeah. However I get it. I mean, I think one of the things that concerns me is what are the policy and financial implications and I don't mean come up with a dollar figure, just to know where they are. Okay. Are there other questions for consideration as this goes to CRC? Shalini. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fast. Okay. Any other questions, considerations? Andy, are you still with us? Yes, I am. <laughs> and I did have a question. I did, um, but I was, uh, it pertains to the motion, so I was waiting till the motion was uh, made. Okay. Let's Would you like to make the motion? Oh, I don't think now. you can, Kenny. Can a person that's remote make the motion? I don't think so. No, I, I'm not making a motion. It's All right. pertaining to the motion. Okay. The motion that I would like to hear is to refer the draft affordable housing priorities policy to the Community Resources Committee with a report back to the Town Council. I believe it was stated by October 1st, 2019. I want to just remind you before we have a second. That report may be that we need more time. Okay. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Anything else at this? Any other further conversation? What? Andy, Andy yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, you had, uh, Lynn had mentioned uh, financial implications as being one of the things that um, needed to be considered. And as a longtime advocate of uh, affordable housing, uh, I've mentioned this with uh, some forethought going into it. But we we're talking about CPA funds, CDBG funds, tax incentive financing, and town surplus property as four out of five named um, subsidy um, costs in, in part four, all of which have significant financial implications on the town. And therefore, it did cross my mind as I was reading this that um, as to whether it should have be, been referred both committees, the finance and um, the uh, CRC committee. And um, I decided what I was going to do is point that out. And then if any members of the finance committee who are in physical attendance at the meeting wish to make a motion to amend to add their, our, um, the additional committee and on which they sit to look at the financial implication questions and be able to comment on them. Um, I'll leave it at, um, to them to make that decision. If none of them come forward, then there's no support for doing so. So that was the one point I was going to make. So as, as a member of finance, what I had thought I would do was go to the CRC meeting when they're talking about this and try to raise those issues. I, th I think it would be efficient if we could do them in one rather than bounce. But I'm fine if there's time to get this before finance also, you know, with the timeline John's laid out. So just looking for feedback on targets and policies. Um, it sounds like adding a framework on what are the resources that we can bring to bear on all of this to make sure my back to where's 250 come from, you know, is it may be a stretch goal, but should at least be not um, 
uh, pass Medicare for all or, you know, you know, something that we can't do here in town, um, something within our reach. Mandy Jo. So I was actually going to say something similar to what Kathy said. Um, unlike this percent for our bylaw that got stuck in two committees and neither committee wanted to do something without knowing what the other committee was doing, I couldn't see this one since it is really going to be just a recommendation and stuff back to the Affordable Housing Trust that both committees can have their conversations at the same time. They don't have to come up with the same thing or be working off a similar document even um, to make those recommendations and bring them back to the council for us to then forward them onto the Housing Trust. So if finance believes there's a financial component that they'd like to consider, I, I would support that referral to them too. Okay, so are you making an amendment to the motion? Sure, I'll move to amend it to add a referral to finance committee. Is there a second? Second. Okay. The motion's been made, the amendment to the motion's been made. Is there any further conversation on the amendment? Then roll call. Yes, Paul. Do you just want to take that as a friendly amendment instead of roll sure. call vote? So the friendly amendment is to refer the draft affordable housing priorities policy to the Community Resource Committee and the Finance Committee with a report back to the Town Council by October 1, 2019. Okay. All right. Uh, are we ready for a roll call vote? Yes. Councillor Griesemer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumelm? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you all for your consideration. I will see you all in one committee or another. Right. Um, <laughs> We are now moving on to item 7E, which is the composite evaluation memo for the town manager. And since I was the one in charge of the changes, let me just explain to you what you have before you. So I took all of our um, recommendations last time, including the ones where I made editorial things and I provided you with a copy where all of those are shown in red and including those paragraphs where there needed to be revisions. Then in addition to that, I went back and using the changed rule of 30%, I unbolded, bolded, or italicized various items. And then, when I got done with all of that, I provided you with a clean copy with only one note. That basically is with regard to page 8. And it said, I did not include the concept of more centralized coordination organization as that should be forwarded to the discussion of goals. And uh, indeed, Shalini just brought that up. So um, I didn't include that. I have since um, been alerted to the fact that there is one typo, and that is on page five under the collective bargaining agreements, and it is in the fourth, one, two, three, Fifth sentence, the word manages should not have an S. It should be manage. Now, we can go through this, and I can highlight the changes, particularly I would note the changes where we have made, you know, additional paragraph kinds of descriptions. And I have prepared a set of slides for that if you'd like to do that. Yes. Dorothy. I, I would like to move to uh, accept the report as um, edited. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Shalini. Okay. Discussion. Uh, yes. 
Minja. So I found a number of um, <clears throat> Scrivener type errors, but we were told not to send them forward before this meeting. Okay. And so I think it would be nice to have a chance to just go through page by page and make those changes okay. before we finalize this. All right. Then um, let's start with page one. Um, well, there, there's a motion on the floor that's been seconded, and uh, this could be done outside of the meeting. Uh, I don't think that we need to take up very, we, we have a lot of things we have to do yet. Alyssa. So I, at the risk of alienating things further, I think it's ridiculous that we're just going to spend two minutes on this and say, okay, yeah, it's fine. But at the same time, we did go through it in great detail before. And if we feel like they are, mo if they are not another substantive, like a sentence or a concept being added or taken out, I would never want to do it this way again, that we're doing it at 1030 at night. Um, but if they re really are just commas and parens and that sort of thing, I think we could do that. But I, I do, I would encourage that if anybody has anything substantive that they felt like wasn't covered, that we should get that into some shape before we vote. Right. Um, The substantive ones are the ones that are up on the screen. And um, we can go through those. And then if you have individual editorial comments, um, perhaps the best thing is to provide me a copy with them in that. So, so Lena, I just, I have a question just on the very first one, because I think this is more Mandy's category of Scribner, although I've never used that word. I do like it. Um, what you've done, I think, is you've highlighted high percentage commendable. Yeah. And you've italicized the needs and improvement. The right. things without anything are just the satisfactory. And mm -hmm. see the way you've got the bold? It has needs improvement yeah. in it. So I think it's purely a typo. Yeah. It because is. I look through what it's you've done, and if it's not if it's not italic and not bold, it means it's the middle, you know. Yeah. Satisfactory. Okay, so that's what you meant to do, and yeah, yeah. So I think of that just as typoish. Okay. Because you did what we. No, but it, it does change the. I think it's significant enough. You should bring it up. Okay. Okay. I think it was a good change that you've got. <laughs> you know, it makes it easy to read. Okay. Are there any other substantive comments? Yes. So on page 14, in a way this is substantive and in a way it's not. Um, okay. The change in the second appearance of the goals is to a question that is not quoted in number one. Question 95 is not the participate in regional assessment method. And so the numbers that were changed, the 38 to 23 and the 54 to 61 is for question 95, but that's not the appropriate question. It's question 38 and the original numbers, the 38%, the 54%, the 0% are the correct numbers for that second appearance of participate in regional assessment method. All right, so I need to check. It's on number, the large five, and then number one. I had it on page 14. Okay. Of the actual. It's participation in the original assessment Assessment method, method. yeah. Okay. So they should, we shouldn't make the change to the last section. Okay. Those should be rejected. And in that case, um, then this should be bold. Correct? Um, yes, because both times it appeared it had over 30% commendable. Yes. Okay. All right. Additional substantive changes. Yes, Evan. So before I say anything about this, I just want to say, as I was unable to be here last week, I want to thank all of my colleagues for what appeared to be a tremendous amount of work um, in making this happen. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to participate 
but I'm also sort of not sorry um, because <laughs> it seems like there's a lot of work. So, so thank you. Um, I, I think this would be considered substantive. So my understanding in, in reading this later was that if 30% or more were commendable, it was bolded to okay. signify. And so um, there seems to be two places. Uh, one is goal seven on page 12. Uh, where it's bolded, but Hold on, only let me just get to it. Yep. Uh, encouraging workplace culture. S yes. S very bottom of page twelve. It seems like it's bolded, but only twenty three percent commendable. That's unbold. Thank you. And then there's a second place on page uh, fifteen, number six. Uh, it's listed as eight percent commendable, um, but that is also bolded. Fifteen number. Six. 15, page Page, page 15, 15, number six, yeah. Number six should unbold, okay? And then again, sorry, again on page 17, uh, number 27, the top one, it's also listed as 8% commendable, 54% unable to judge. Um, that should be unbolded as well. Which one, I'm sorry, number uh, Page 17, it's gold 17. 27, it's at the very top of the page. Okay, that should also be unbold. Okay. Andy, you lost him. Yes. Alyssa, I actually wanted to make sure that you read the Thing about modernizing and saw whether or not I captured the essence of that. Yes, Andy. Andy says, let's call it quits. He so wants to call a question? He, 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 no, he wants to, I think he wants to discontinue his remote participation at this point. Okay. It's just become too difficult. And too late. <laughs> okay, Alyssa, any? I saw it just a moment ago. Do you have the page reference in front of you? Oh, boy, I thought you'd ask me that. Uh, it's toward the end. It's on page 19, room for improvement. Yes. Nicely phrased. Thank you. Uh, yes, technical, yeah, I think that's close. That works. Okay. Are there any other changes at this time? Does this mean we need to see, we have, to, we can cease doing roll call? It yes. does? Yes. Okay. Yes, um, just one quick one that I don't know whether is, is, but number 17 on page 16, the very top goal, 16. had two needs improvements. Um, when I went back and checked, the 0% is the one that should be deleted. The 8% is what showed up in the, so 8% is... Is the good one, is the accurate oh, one, and the 0% needs, needs improvement should be yeah. the one deleted. Okay. Got it. Are there other... If you have additional changes because of editorials, then please give me either a hard marked up copy or another one, but send it to only me. Alyssa? Just quickly, when you refinish this again and yes. we don't vote on it again because it's just done based on right. the things that you have and it gets published, which is sometimes something we forget, but it gets published in our next packet mm -hmm. so everyone can see what the final version looks like, please don't call it a composite because it's not. It's a summary. And what is it that you would like me to call it? The title on the document itself is fine. It's just when it was labeled in the packet, it was called a composite. A composite was like including, it's, that was like the giant stacks an, of paper. Okay. This is a summary. So this will just be called the FY19 Town Manager Performance Evaluation. Okay. All right, if you're ready to move on, call the question. 
And we, is the motion, uh, the motion has been made. Um, the, to adopt the Pub town public manager. Public comment. Yes. We had said there would be public comment on this. I'm sorry? Public comment from the agenda. Exactly, I'm sorry. Are there, is there any public comment? See none, even though we still have some public here. Um, thank you. Um, okay, the motion that was made was to accept it. Accept. And it's to accept as amended. As amended. The town manager evaluation moment. Mo memo and that motion was seconded correct okay anybody else any further comment call the question all those in favor say aye and raise your hand aye. Uh, opposed abstain yes one abstention okay from um, Darcy, yes. The word composite got removed from the motion then. I did. Yeah. Okay, so the motion passed with 11 yeses, no abstentions, I mean no no's, one abstention and one absent. Paul, thank you for a very good year. <laughs> thank you all for all your work on this. It's We didn't say that last week, and I think we all felt like we went away not finishing our work. Yes. Um, all right, we are going to go on with the agenda at this time. The next item is appointments. And um, the first of the, and both of these are town manager appointments. And so OCA is the uh, recommending group. And the first one is the Design Review Board. Sure. Uh, so OCA discussed and voted on these uh, this morning. So we don't have a written report for you. Um, I'm going to just, if it's OK, speak to both of them because we sort of discussed them the, together, sure. the Design Review Board and the Board of Assessors. We'll vote on them separately, but yes. Vote on them separately, but um, OCA voted unanimously to recommend both of these sets of appointments. Um, we had a really uh, good discussion with the town manager uh, this morning in our meeting uh, regarding two things in particular. One was reappointments. You'll notice that the Board of Assessors are all reappointments, um, and there were some questions about uh, how reappointments take place if they're automatic and if people uh, apply for vacancies but there are already reappointments, uh, what happens to those people? And the town manager has assured us that anyone who applies uh, gets an interview, even if for a committee such as this one, uh, there are people who are up for reappointment who are likely going to get reappointed. Um, everyone gets an interview in part because they might be interested in the future, in part because he might find another committee for them, and in part because if they are perhaps better than one of the candidates already on the committee, uh, there might be a conversation to have about whether someone gets reappointed. Um, and I think that was uh, a good thing for us to hear because uh, there was some concern about is there really a vacancy if someone's just going to get reappointed. Um, the second part was about um, uh, vacancy notices. Um, requesting that going forward um, our packets include uh, not only the appointments and the charge but also uh, the vacancy notice that went out to advertise for the committee um, because that's part of the charter mandated process and, and we see one of our roles as in OCA and perhaps also as town council is making sure the process uh, is being followed and so making sure that those vacancy notices are provided uh, so that we can see what was done to recruit people for a committee. Okay. So we're going to take the design review board first. Is there a motion? And the motion would read, yes, Alyssa. Uh, two things. Before you read the motion, Erica has got a K in Erica. It's Erica. It, it was correct in our memo from the e town manager. E-R-I-C-K-A. E-R-I-K-A. 
E R I K A. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And I also was, I could make the motion, but I also wanted to make one more comment on something okay, that our please. chair of OCA mentioned. I just want to be super clear that the phrase, everyone gets an interview, means everyone who isn't a reappointment. Reappointments don't get interviewed at this particular moment in time, which is a topic of discussion. But please understand that reappointments are not getting interviewed, but anybody else who has asked, as, as Evan pointed out, we asked about that. Everyone else who asked, even if you think you're going to reappoint somebody, did get interviewed. Okay. Any further comments at this time? Alyssa, you want to make the motion? I move to approve the following town manager appointments to design review board effective immediately as recommended by the outreach communications and appointments committee verbal report of August 26, 2019. Um, I'm also including a comment between, between communications and appointments because that's the name of our committee. For a three year term to expire June 30th, 2022, Lindsay Schnarr, a reappointment. For a two year term to expire June 30th, 2021, Catherine Porter, a reappointment. And for a one year term to expire June 30th, 2020, Erica Zikos. Is there's a motion? Is there a I'll, second? I'll second that. Evan Ross has seconded it. Any further conversation? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? We have one abstention. Okay. And one absence. So it's 11 4, and none opposed, one abstain, and one absent. All right. Moving on to the Board of Assessors. Alyssa. Sure, I can read. I'm also going to add a comma between communications and appointments. Got it. I move to approve the following town manager appointments to the Board of Assessors, effective immediately, as recommended by the Outreach, Communications, Comma, and Appointments Committee, verbal report of August 26, 2019. For a three-year term to expire June 30, 2022, LeGrand Hines, a reappointment, and for a two-year term to expire June 30, 2021, Ken Hargreaves, reappointment. Is there a second? second? George Ryan seconded that. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Oh, I'm sorry. Dorothy was, Darcy was opposed. Oh, I'm sorry, your hand. Okay, let's start over. All of those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 12 for one absent. Okay. Okay, we're moving on to committee reports. Okay, audit, Pat? Uh, yes, we'll be meeting at the end of October to create a timeline to uh, get out the RFP probably in January. Okay. Um, I'm going to slip right into bylaw review. Please. Yeah. We are um, continuing right now to go through for some refining some of the final bylaws. Uh, we'll have a clean uh, copy starting around September 5th, but we'll be bringing um, the final report and presentation to the council by November 1st. Okay, and that will require two readings? Yes. As well as a hearing? I think. We'll figure that out. Okay. I don't know if it needs a hearing. No, I don't think so. It's, it's just two readings. Uh, Steve, CRC. Really, there's no report other than to say that we continue discussion of the master plan at our last meeting. Okay. And we're changing our time in September to um, 8.30 to 10.15-ish. Um, on Wednesdays. On Wednesdays to accommodate my teaching schedule. So thank you to the other members of CRC okay. and to all of you that are going to come to our meetings. Okay. Uh, I have no report for the Council Goals Ad Hoc Committee. Finance Committee, uh, Kathy? 
Uh, there isn't any report, but I want to remind people that on September 5th, there is a special meeting with finance and JCPC. So in addition to some of the other issues, we will be discussing um, the large building projects at that meeting in a joint way. And, and it's taking place in the evening. It's an evening slot. 7 o'clock. It's posted, and there is an agenda for it. So if anyone wants to just come and listen to that, um, it's the first time we've done it in a joint way. And the goal of that discussion okay. is to talk is to begin September to talk 5th. about how to roll it out for uh, discussion across the council and also the community. Okay. We've also posted it so that if more members of the council are there than and want to participate, it can actually be a committee of the whole. Uh, GOL? It was all in the written report. Okay. Uh, Oka? The only thing I'll add is that uh, starting in the fall, Oka will begin reviewing its process to bring forward appointments, uh, or recommended appointments for town council appointed committees. And will you be bringing that forward to the council for our comment? Let's see what we get done. Our hope is our hope is to have something for December, but Great. we recognize it's going to take some time. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, moving on to approval of minutes, the motion is to approve the August nineteenth, two thousand nineteen town council mi meeting minutes. Um, as presented, are is there a second? Second. Okay. Mandy Jo did a second. Are there questions, comments, changes? Okay, seeing none, and let's move on to approval of the minutes as presented. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, so we had eight, four, none against, four abstain and one absent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, town manager's report. Thank you. Uh, just a few items. I want to mention the CPOs, our community participation officers, are very busy at this time of year. They're reaching out at, to, at the um, various school events, both for the university and the colleges, but also for elementary and secondary schools. They are, will be attending the Neighborhood Resource Fair, which is September 6th in the Phillips Street neighborhood. Um, they've been uh, engaged with the Complete Count Committee. That's, they see that as an important target for their work. Um, and they are also seeking out additional um, educational opportunities for themselves, which I'm really encouraging. And uh, so we'll, I'll talk more about that next time. The uh, Ranked Choice Voting Commission met with the uh, town attorney. And uh, the sort of important thing there, just got the important things is that um, the state law will regulate uh, pretty much what the town is able to come up with. Uh, whatever we do for our next voting uh, will need to be, will need special legislation. If it's something outside the no normal sort of straight, the way we have done elections in the past, it's going to be ranked choice. It could be a hard uh, thing to pass at the state level because they don't want to start to pass individual laws. The Ranked Choice Voting Commission understood this uh, and will probably move its deadline for its report earlier so there's ample time to get through, to talk through, to go through the legislature. Uh, town attorney encouraged the Ranked Choice Voting Commission to engage our state senator and state representative early on, uh, which they intend to do. Um, and we will have a, they will have a backup plan which will be a traditional voting model with perhaps a preliminary voting uh, that would also have to go through the state legislature since we don't have anything for that at this moment in time. So they're on it. It's a really strong committee um, and they're working pretty diligently. 
Uh, and the third thing is that the, um, we are recruiting for the principal assessor. David Burgess was here tonight. He's offered to continue to working, um, but we understand that he wants to call it quits sooner than later. So we are going to be actively recruiting for the principal assessor, which will, once we recruit, uh, interview, uh, and appoint, then that would go to, through OCA and we'll time that so you have ample time for the council to act on that. And then uh, we'll see you all tomorrow morning at 7.30, just in a few hours, <laughs> at the uh, University Community Breakfast, and then tomorrow night at the first night, uh, first day of school event. Thank you. Okay. I really urge, uh, are there questions of the town manager, or comments on his report? Alyssa. I wonder if ranked choice voting might come to talk to us sooner rather than later, given those options, because I'm adamantly opposed to having a preliminary election, 100% and 10%. So that's not a, an adequate backup plan, in my opinion. I would much rather default to nothing. And so rather than, I'm not saying I would win that conversation, but I think that conversation needs to be held with ranked choice voting before they go too far down a road in okay. terms of what they assume we might want because there are plenty of communities that don't have preliminary elections and they get along just fine. Okay. Um, the other question, the other comment I had is in regards to the beautiful but unfortunately not actually readable by our computers in terms of search terms, uh, town manager report, which is always an image rather than something I can actually say, show me the part where it talks about the shelter. Um, is that it is very repetitive from week to week. And so I'm wondering if we want to have a brief conversation at some point, not now, uh, about what we would love to see in the town manager report so that he could put less work into it potentially and it would have new things on an every two week basis, not three quarters of the same things plus some new things worked in there. Because my eyes glaze over when I've read the same thing the third time and I'm missing some of the new parts. So okay. I just, I want to make that simpler for everybody. Okay. Comment on that? Yes. Paul. Paul. So if you read the very first line, it says this report is pretty much the same as the last re report right. <laughs> because we didn't get a chance, it came so late in the evening that council did not want to really talk about it. So right. I changed some things, but most of it was in case you wanted to bring up something. So that's why I put that first line in there to say, in case it looks the same, it probably is. I, I'm glad you mentioned it because I was going to mention it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Shalini. Uh, regarding Groff Park, I know there was going to be a program for kids, and since Groff Park has not happened, is that program going to be rolled over for next year? What happens to that allocation? That's a really good question. I don't have the answer to that question, it's, um, but the intent was to have Groff Park open earlier, and so it would, it would make perfect sense to do it next, next spring or next summer when school lets out. That's a really good point. I had not thought about that. Thank you. I'm sorry, Darcy. Um, I just uh, uh, want to commend you because I really do like these um, town manager reports. Um, and I have been sharing them at my district meetings. And, but I did think that maybe um, you could somehow highlight whatever the new information is on the report because I think it is actually good to still have the older information um, because you know it's relevant until it's past the mm -hmm. the date. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention the um, Crocker Farm School study because um, I think there's there's still a, a you know a number of people, constituents, and others who really are pushing to um, get started, use the funding that was, that's been put in the budget and get started with that study so that we can jumpstart um, that piece of what we need to do and not wait for the MSBA report. Mandy Jo. I would second Darcy's comments on the Crocker Farm. I think for us, as we move into the capital planning, having information about what's possible at Crocker and how much it might cost would be helpful to the council's planning for capital planning purposes. 
Yeah, and we do intend to move, get moving on that, but at this time of year, the superintendent isn't prepared to take on this right at the beginning of the school, but we're, we'll have a schedule by mid-September on rollout. Okay, thank you. Additional comments, questions? Okay, then we're going to move on to town council comments. I don't have any comments unless somebody wants to ask me a question. How'd you spend your weekend? Um, <laughs> future agenda items? Councilor comments? All right, topics not anticipated. Uh, one future agenda item yep. uh, is, I don't think, unless I missed it, we've ever done liaisons. You had asked us at one yep. point to say which where we wanted to be. Yep. So at some point, if you sent out a what do we want to liaise with? We could okay. stop going to four or five meetings because we would know this one was ours. So it's just one I keep, okay. I know it's been too big an agenda to do this stuff, but yeah. Okay. Additional comments? Yes. Quickly Listen. announcements. There's, as you had done announcements at the beginning, we want to make sure everybody's reminded of the parking forum that's Wednesday night at 5.30 in this room. A little bit of a different time, so 5.30 this room on Wednesday. And the other thing is we keep talking about the joint JCPC Town um, Finance Committee meeting as though it's posted. It's not posted. So we'll check on that. Thank you. It is that, in fact, will be posted, and it is on uh, September 5th at no, at seven o'clock in this room. Yes. I, I remember that Andy's um, said that the finance committee should come at six because we have to deal with um, that's correct. Big issue. We have several issues yep. to deal with. All of which will then be brought before the council on September 9th or soon after. Okay. Additional comments. All right, topics not reasonably, reasonably anticipated. I see none. Then let me just state to the public we're going to move into executive session. We're doing that for three reasons. One is to discuss the strategy with respect to collective bargaining uh, for units SEIU, DPW, DPW supervisors, police patrol, and police supervisors. Um, I think we would also hear about fire. Uh, as strategy session in preparation for negotiation with uh, non-union personnel, town manager Paul Bachman, and then finally to conduct contract negotiations. I will mention that we will not return to open session, and um, if we conclude successful negotiations with the town manager, we will have a press release sometime tomorrow. Uh, so therefore I ask that a motion be made to enter, enter into executive session for the purpose set forth in the agenda item. Second. Okay. And that'll be a roll call vote. Councilor Haneke? Yes. Councilor Pam? Yes. Councilor Ross? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Yes. Councilor Shane? Yes. Councilor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumilm? Yes. Councillor Brewer? No. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Alyssa, do you want to tell us? I've never seen an executive session treated so casually. We need to read off the rationale from MGL. I understand that you were, tr you were explaining it to the public, but if we could ask the clerk of the council, for example, to insert those sections. This needs to show up in our minutes, and it can't show up in our minutes very well. Right. There is a motion, we and we would like to have that inserted into Thank the you. minutes. That would be very helpful. Okay. All right. The f so we will do that, and at this point, the vote was 11, 4, 1 opposed, and 1 absent. 